Hopefully everyone is uh, adequately fed and caffeinated and ready for another good day of deep conversations around community goals. Um, one thing that happened as we were adjourning yesterday is Eric Wallace came for public invited to be heard um, and we had just adjourned. So I promised him, he had it already written out, so I promised him that I would read you his public invited to be heard. Mary, you're welcome to time me if you'd like. Um, and he asked me to. Oh, <laughs> he asked me to read it in his voice. Oh. <laughs> and I, felt, yeah, I felt like I needed a foot also of height, but uh, I, I also feel like that could be disastrous. So I'll stay on the ground. But um, so I, I promised him that I would read that for you first thing. So here's Eric's testimony. Um, Eric Wallace, three three nine Pratt Street. As a father, I want three things of my offspring to be able to afford to live in Longmont. Let's provide the housing supply and types of homes needed to meet demand. I'm the employer of 60 people, half of whom live out of county. The farther they commute to afford to live, the shorter their tenure, tenure is and the less viable is my business. I would like as many of my people that so desire to be able to afford to live in Longmont. I am the co-chair of Prosper Longmont. We encourage you to continue to streamline the approval process for a wide variety of homes, make infill developments easier to build, and consider other innovative ways of reducing the costs of four purchased homes that our local workforce can afford. Building equity in the home builds sustainability and resilience for our residents within a community. As a board member of the Longmont EDP, a group dedicated to Longmont employers and citizens that volunteer their time and invest their own money alongside that of the city to realize the advanced Longmont 2.0, the sister plan to our strategic comp plan, Envision Longmont, I encourage you to embrace our approach of collective impact and the realization of the goals laid out in the comp plans. These plans are serious uh, and well thought out documents that lay collectively developed vision for our future of our city. Tens of thousands of hours of people time from throughout the community were involved in writing these plans. We all need to stay focused on the strategic plans over an extended period of time in order to realize the vision of the community through your election has tasks with you with realizing. We are your partners in this endeavor. As a cyclist and a climate change believer, I encourage you to continue to invest in bike infrastructure and bikeability, walkability, and prioritize denser mixed use development along primary transit corridors within the areas of redevelopment. The only way that we are going to make bikes and transit a more realistic alternative to cars is to internationally build our city in a way that prioritizes multimodal transit and gives people a convenient option to get from where they are to where they want to be safely and in a reasonable amount of time. Neighborhoods in development and redevelopment areas need to be built with walkability, bikeability, primary needs, proximity, and availability and access to transit in the forefront. The way to developing successful transit systems is to push, is to put enough potential riders and amenities close to the stops of the system to make the system financially viable. Towns our size have done this all over the world. They are more for they are far more mixed use and densely built. We have way too much asphalt. Our current zoning laws in the county are frequently the downstream result of racist and economically discriminatory policies from decades ago. We need to consciously build more diversity into our neighborhoods and cities, mixing housing types, businesses, and gathering spaces that increase social cohesion and foster inclusion and diversity throughout the city. Longmont is a fortunate beneficiary of the excellent resources and infrastructure passed down from our forefathers. We are posed, poised to build our community for the future and ensure future generations harvest the fruits of a collective vision that we can put into effect now. Okay, I will give this to City Clerk Kim Connor. She's a further record. Okay, well with that speech, that's kind of a good way to get started because today we're going to be talking about the goals that you discussed yesterday, kind of helping to try to work through what does success look like, um, and then we'll dive a little deeper into some specific topics um, around some of the environmental roadmaps um, and a couple of questions, other questions that you all have that we'll dive into. So, oops, that's not my presentation. Started there. And that is the plan for today. Just as a reminder, a couple things. So you, oh yeah, <laughs> you have a little, you have a little homework yesterday, um, and that was to take a look at the city's accomplishments and the areas of influence from the 2020 work plan developed in 2018, um, and to take a look and see all the great stuff that has happened. And you know, I sort of hate to negate the opportunity to celebrate those things, but I'm, my guess is that as you read through them yesterday, you probably had a smile on your face, recognizing exactly how far we have come over the last four years. 
Um, so I, I think that's great. We're going to talk about the vision this morning, start with the vision conversation, move into some of those goals around the, the focus areas you discussed yesterday. Then we'll start to talk a little bit about the roadmaps, the environmental roadmaps. And then at noon, exciting, we're gonna give away a fire truck. So that's gonna be fun. The Sister Cities folks will be here and we'll be able to, I'm not sure whether we're gonna wave goodbye. I might just go around the circle because then they're gonna stay for lunch. <coughs> but nonetheless, we're still gonna give them a fire engine eight at noon today uh, to our Sister Cities in Suda this month, followed by a lunch where our Sister Cities folks are going to join us and then we'll wrap up any elements of the work planning that we haven't done at that point. So that's the plan for today. So do you wanna get started on the vision? So we're, we left off yesterday, as we said, um, we wanted you all to look at the, the council vision that you all established in 2020, and, and really, um, this is more for you all to discuss amongst each other, is, um, is this still your vision? Um, if it's not your vision, what do you want to change? Um, and just really, um, this sets the basis for where we're going to go uh, in, in the next parts of the conversation. So I will turn it over to you all in terms of starting with the, the vision for people. Maybe we talk, start with the people vision. Are there pieces that are missing? And I think what I'll do is come out of presentation mode so that if there's some notes that you guys would like to make. I was just gonna comment that 20 years probably needs to be a year. Other, otherwise, every year it's going to say 20 years. <laughs> yes, and the other one says in 2040. Mm -hmm. Not sure how we ended up that way. <laughs> <laughs> I was there for it. So John. I remember in uh, 2000, uh, and I was on, I think, one of the zones he had invited right to uh, uh, a 2020 Vision 20, and it was designed to have those uh, conversations of what the city is looking like. And then, of course, you know, as we get closer, closer to that, we recalibrate. Re Every year, I think, you know, based on what Harold was saying in regards to the fact that he's only had a year and a half of times that we didn't have some sort of some sort of major event happening mm -hmm. since he, his tenure of being here in the city. It's, it's, it is important to always, and this is why this, situation of us coming together in a retreat is so important because we need these opportunities to recalibrate to and and talk about what what is working what's not working and not continuing on it's 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 one of the critical components of our community but but i think um, you know that vision statement there is is a good one because it, it, it encompasses some of the things that our community is really that the state moving towards. It's a very aspirational thing. Mm -hmm. There are so many things that can be done. Would you like for me to add in 2040 so that we are kind of consistent with what that goal is? Just go ahead and talk about the place. Yeah, Mark, Mary, did you want to add something? Well, I was just thinking that regardless of what year the council looks at that, it would still be 20 years from that date. So um, we could go back and say, change what it is that we <coughs> want that we to be based upon where we are technically, technologically, environmentally. But it would be 20 years from whatever year you want. Does that not push it out? Doesn't that keep saying in 20 years so you never get there if it's always 20 years out? Then well, it's not finite and well just a thought and that's why i was thinking that maybe we actually achieve what's in our vision today so they might change the what's what they are looking at for their vision just a thought so then Marcia, do visions typically have a, a year on them so rather than saying we yeah. strive for long on to be the world's greatest vision or long on strives to be the world's greatest vision I, I would argue that, that that's more standard for others. Yeah, because then it's your goals that have time that are yeah. Yeah. yeah, I just feel like then if all we're doing is just changing the date, it just looks like we're kicking the can down the road. Exactly. So, Marsha? I was about to say almost the same thing, and I, um, because 
Um, it is a goal that you never reach. Your, your demographics change, the stand expectations for standard of living change, um, hopefully increase. What if we said increasingly Longmont becomes, and then <coughs> we're always <coughs> trying to get better. I like that. I like that you change it too, this thing. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense because for some people that vision may be true today. And so the, the concept is yeah. to work towards making that true for everybody. Mm -hmm. right. I, I really think 2020 thing was all about having you know clear vision uh, ahead of time. Because in that that was 20 years ago. It's not anything to do with the 20 year vision of Long so much as it's it had a nice play on on what it's about having a clear vision. Yeah. What about places? Well, before we go off of that, I just, yeah, sorry. Um, in my mind, a vision statement, a vision is a, is a description of a future state, mm -hmm. right? So tagging it a year on it for me is not a problem. It is, because um, that's whether, you, whether it's fully realized or not. But I don't buy the idea that, that you never achieve your vision. Uh, you know, you, it might get clearer and clearer as you go along, but if, if a vision, and I don't think we ever discussed a criteria or definition for vision, and I'm not suggesting you do that, just my mindset is <coughs> what we're doing right now is describing a future state that we intend to achieve, and, and then we talk about goals and objectives to get us there. So. Yes, yep. That's my understanding of vision as well. So strive to, for me, Sorry, yeah. isn't, isn't, uh, it's not a vision statement. Because the vision is that Longmont is this. Yeah. Go ahead and take a read one more time. I like this. It just took the years off yeah. and time frames off. I have to say, as a city staff person, this is such a beautiful vision it because then it's just it's well. such a north star for yeah. us around what we're trying to do in the world. Well, and, you know, when we talked about core services, how this applies to core services for us is really important <clears throat> because even as we look at core services, we're referring to, or I refer to this vision to go, is what we're doing in this core service moving us in the direction of this vision. And if it's not, then maybe we need to look at relook at how we're approaching our core service so that it does, it is a contributing factor to the to the vision. So you see us play you see it play both ways. Not only in your goals, but what we do on a daily basis. To make that feel a little more inclusive, <coughs> excuse me, would it be helpful to say where all people? Because I'm thinking about putting on that equity and inclusion lens yes. how does it make sure it feels that way as opposed to everyone uh -huh. that all well, all people all people does it feel more inclusive to add that word rather than everyone yes or where people where all where people have people access have. i'm sorry or somewhere in there where i just feel like all people have access yes the will. i got you right here the, yeah. there or all people will have access to each other because it's yeah. really about housing for all. I'm trying to you yeah. know, think about how does that appear. And what I heard Susie say was, do we need the word will? Because yeah. we went from, in 20 years, this will happen to where the state of being is current. Do we have to yeah. mm -hmm. Well, people just have access. Mm -hmm. That's what it's ended. Yeah. Places. Places. Everyone's good with the. Mm -hmm. I like it. This could be the fist to five. Wait, what? You're going to do fist to five. <laughs> fist to five? No, oh, good. five. Love it. Love it. Love it. Or whatever you want. Everyone okay? <laughs> I'm good. I think places need to use because those are specifics. Mm -hmm. Have some more specific things in the places section, that's for sure. And to Susie's point, maybe is that Longmont has a developed. We're not there yet. Or has it developed? 
Yeah, it has developed. Uh -huh. Main Street from four to sixty-six. Oops, is that a will? Will yeah. have a center. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Now up to Main Street from Pike to sixty-six. I want something in there about transportation. We're recording the statutes. Don't put fifteen minutes in. No, but what? <laughs> oh, there's a there's a, a group of <clears throat> people who think that this is an authoritarian plot for fifteen minutes in. Oh, <laughs> to be able to get across the city in fifteen minutes. So please just don't use that keyword. <laughs> I need to get across the city. Once you trigger the rest of my. No, it's not about getting across. It's about creating neighborhoods that are walkable by oh, train. Right, you're never more than 15 minutes from walking from whatever you need right. to, to live your life. Mm -hmm. right. That's the, that's the, that's the have, you haven't been reading yeah. those emails? I have not seen any of that. Yes, okay. Yeah, so <laughs> we've had a bunch of them. Is it sort of accessibility in a sense? Because that worked in a lot of things, but. So what I heard from, from Dr. Cog is that we were talking about um, transit, either regional or that the 15 minute, um, so what's it called? 15 minutes you only have to wait for transit. That's the way Dr. Cog wrote it was. Gotcha. So you're not sitting at a bus stop for half an hour. Does it make sense to add transportation here at the beginning? That's, and Mary, tell me a little bit more about what you're thinking. With respect to <coughs> your, what is your vision in that arena? That My vision is that we have, um, I'm trying to get that into the mindset of everybody that transportation, as we are building our cities, <coughs> we need to have that a goal in places that we have transportation for. Everybody, I don't know how to say it. I think it would fit better around the quality of life sentence. So you mm -hmm. well transportation like reliable yes transportation system or something along or robust transportation. Yeah. I because I think that's more in the quality of life section of the mm -hmm. places. Okay. That's where we fit in at right. least as, as I read it. Awesome. The the way the UN defines it is is that you are within fifteen minutes, even though we shouldn't say fifteen minutes. Um, but the close proximity, access, yeah, access or proximity to all of life's activities without the requirement that you own a personal vehicle. Walkable proximity, same thing. Or? I think that may be too narrow <clears throat> when you when you take that because when you look at a transportation system that supports that, you know, when we think about the first main transit center, which really is the hub and the continent, that is, so I think if you just focus on that, it sort of is dying down a level, and how do you stay up high to, to can look, we, look can at we the say forest. a transportation system that supports our quality of life? Does that make sense? Transportation options instead of system, because system is not necessarily prescriptive. So that's pres that's prescriptive. That's right. For that moment. multi -normal. There you go. I think mobility is a better word because that really addresses yeah. people at all stages. Mm -hmm. That's right. Opportunity for access as opposed to just yeah. transportation. And multimodal like also that. is prescriptive in its way. Right. Take out transportation. Take out transportation has that <coughs> mobility option. Yeah, well, it by itself is not, yeah, or, 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 or alternative mobility. Or, I'm not sure they even need the access piece to it because the idea is that mm -hmm. you have it, mm -hmm. so therefore you have the yeah. access. Yeah. Lockhart's quality of life includes mobility options and systems, but there's some people that are not. Yeah, yeah. 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 that sounds so much better than Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like that. Yeah. Choice, hundred percent sustainable, sustainable mobility, mobility options and renewable. You know, it's enjoyed, it's we enjoy moving to renewable energy because we don't. Our so it keeps you fast. You push your fast. Yeah, and air, 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 air,
you know, as I think about our conversation on Vision Zero and where we're going, maybe it's Monmark's quality of life includes mobility options. Safe. Safe mobility options mm -hmm. that not necessarily balance because Vision Zero is putting pedestrians and bicyclists at a higher priority than cars, but bringing some lanes in Germany or Brisbane can help with how we can say safe mobility options that prioritizes pedestrians, bicyclists. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out. Um, okay, so help me with the climate piece of it. So, Monmouth's quality of life includes safe mobility options and enjoys 100% renewable power. There's so much more to the climate, climate sustainability conversation, so, but the end of this sentence doesn't right. catch it. So, why is it respecting as opposed to addressing? That's what I'm looking for. Help me. Because, <laughs> yeah, you respect the natural environment here, but you address climate, if that makes sense. Or you can say something along the lines of yeah, so right. climate initiatives or one of the different ways to look at it. Too much? Maybe too much. There you go. That sounds good. Because yeah, that's how you go. It's really shifting based yes. on what you see in the data. So do you think that covers environmental as well? Okay, good. Yeah. 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 So, what are the taglines? What are the taglines? Tagline. There's a lot of words in there. So a lot of words in there. Get yeah. us a tagline uh, uh, for both of them. Not right now. But. You know, certainly when I'm lobbying on your behalf, oftentimes, you know, the, the big topics that I'm talking about for folks, you know, the, the, this council is very focused on uh, transportation, they're very focused on environmental issues, but sustainability and the whole piece of it, right? So sustainability has three pieces to it. There's environmental, there's social, and then there's economic. And it's the balance of those things that makes it what it is as opposed to just climate change. Right. But I think it was important to you all to put that renewable energy role right in the vision, because that was a big sweeping thing that changed the whole region, actually. Yes. And, uh, I, I I don't want to upset this apple cart because I'm really happy with what we've got here, but economic sustainability is not mentioned, and it's something we have to defend every day because a lot of people, when they um, don't like something that the city is doing, we're doing it for economic sustainability, and that's not in their mental calculations. So as we message, I'd like to make sure that, uh, that economic sustainability is, it, it's core, it's, it's part, part of the core. And yeah. nobody yeah. realizes that. Yeah. Well, that's what pays for all of this. Yes. Exactly. So can you put like the last little paragraph there, Longmont's quality of life and economic um, stability includes sustainability options. Does that make sense? I like economic stability. Or yeah, stability. Stability or vitality? Vitality is not better. Yeah, that's a better word. Yeah, a better word. <laughs> and should that be the first sentence that's a little more global and then you talk more specifically about the rest of that? Oh, that's a good idea because we're starting out with. Yeah, it's very specific. So maybe you need to talk about. Yeah. Yes. It's really more, the last sentence is more aspirational and the yeah, first sentence first is more sure. specific, so. Yeah. Like now you just need a space. There you go. Not, what? What? Not there. Not there. <laughs> there we go. I have a question on Longmont as development street. Yeah. In my mind, I don't know what that really means, develop. I mean, I came up with the word vibrant, inviting, living, community corridor, across my music. I think that's the shift from we'll do this to what we want to see in the world, David. I think that's a great catch. So I think we can change that to say, that's why my has a vibrant street from yeah. 5 to 66. 
a river corridor that stretches from Sugar Mill to fairgrounds. We have light went through there twice. Yeah. yeah. And that feels like it's sort of a dangling modifier over here. I don't know what that's really talking about. As a vibrant economic residential. You know what I'm saying? If you read that, it's not super clear. But it's vibrant economic residential cultural entertainment. At the center. Okay. Isn't it? But it should be a river corridor as an economic blah, blah, blah. That stretches. I think it's the modifier is in one place. But in fact, it works better without the word at all. And then you can have it yeah. on Main Street. Yes. I think that's true too. I think that's good. Yeah, that looks good. All right. It's just a small issue. Yeah, something doesn't need to be done. How much quality of life? Right now, safe mobility options, and enjoys a 10% renewable power while adjusting the effects of climate change over time. Transition from the fairgrounds as it is now. Main Street from Pike to 66, and the river corridor that stretches from Sugar Mill to the fairgrounds. That is, does that make sense? That is form an economic, residential, cultural, and entertainment epicenter. I don't know that we need this modifier here either. Sustainable. Do we need uh, economic? Is the sugar mill part, do we need to say economic again? Since it's up at the top? No, because you've already said that you're going to include that in everything you're looking at. It's a residential, cultural, and entertainment kind of center. I love that, by the way. It's very easy to, you know, attach to that as the city staff talks about this epicenter. I guess, I, I guess I'm wondering uh, why we would have, have to remind people that it's Longmont the second time in that vision statement. Longmont's quality of life, and we say again, Longmont has a, like, let's just we just say we. Yeah, we have. Uh, we have. Yeah. We have, yes. we have, we have the Bible Main Street. Or there it is. I think we just should change it and say y'all. Yeah. <laughs> now you're talking. We've got one street that's cheap as hell talking about. Don't drink the meat. Y'all. I'm telling you, we started to surround it actually right here. She's done it. Y'all. as opposed to all of Main Street, all of Denver, all of Fairgrounds. Like maybe there's a way to, to be specific about it. You know, every stretch of Main Street isn't going to be the same, but how do you, you know, what the key notes are that would be the transportation, facilitation, all the things people want in the last wall. Can we use the word new? How do we just say a vibrant main a vibrant main street and a river corridor so you might have vibrant river corridor and main street. But that's yeah. more specific. It doesn't necessarily delineate the boundaries specific high road right. to six years. Yeah. The idea is that the east and west. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so Mark is thinking about that asking yeah. whether fairgrounds is the end or is it further to that? Further than the fairgrounds, is it all the way to airport road? That's not where the city plan was, but well, all the way to airport may not be uh, developable. Developable. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I'm sorry, I got a little lost in there. What, you, what, <laughs> what other changes would you like to see? I was just wondering if it was necessary to delineate the boundaries. Oh, I see. Because then you're not talking about the Sugar Mill Fairgrounds or Sugar Mill Airport, you're just saying the river corridor. Or you're just saying Main Street instead of needing bike road to 66. And the river corridor currently is west of Boulder. That's right. The river corridor goes is, goes all the way up to Lyons. Right. 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 That's the stop at some point. Oh. That's what we're calling some of the lights. Well, maybe you could say our river corridor. Was not yeah. focused, but that's what you're saying. Let me let me take yeah. out those qualifiers and see what you think. 
we take out the two qualifiers and then let's see. Now you get rid of the comma. Yeah. <laughs> and and maybe it's there is. That's what you were saying, Ron. Right. Rather than the division. Are we? Are yeah. And then I'm just so looking at so the words so so from the previous initiatives, and I'm just going to throw out a couple words that are also um, referenced, and that was. Um, about bringing together private industry and local government and nonprofits, institutions, blah, 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 for the best prepared workforce in the Western US. So that was part of places. I don't know if that's anything. And then, of course, references to the Conference and Performance Center. So, just a couple of things that aren't included in that that were sub bullets to places. The Performance Center is um, the entertainment. Episode. Oh, sorry. It says the vibrant Main Street and a river corridor that is residential. It's sort of like you're describing Main Street River Corridor as the residential cultural kind of center. And I think our environmental is that and it's I think the environmentalists would not know if this at all in the river corridor in there as a residential cultural. Because they're going to say you're going to build all of this on the river corridor. That's the way it's going to be. Especially so that before. Yeah. And, and we have these protections that are respecting the natural environment. You know, with our coach, you can't get close enough to the river to make a mess already. Well, and maybe the place qualifiers help us with that. Maybe I thought we could drop it back in and see what you think. Because the other piece of it is that you're saying this is the piece we're focused on and not every bit of river, right? It is this plan that we're referring to, so let me pull that back in here. Maybe that's what helps is because you're saying this is the focus, this place is the focus. Yeah, you know, you can take out the I should highway 66, that they don't have to be perfectly symmetrical. Main Street is Main Street. So, um, just a thought uh, that we are talking about a specific part <coughs> in our places where you make some kind of a statement about connecting neighborhoods to these places and to the corridors. Um, because, or is this is that the idea of the mobility no. option? Well, that it's a question. Um, does this belong in places, or is there another part? Mainly because isn't this what Envision Walmart is telling us that we need to connect? Or am I taking it too far, too deep? <laughs> My personal opinion is that we don't want to get too prescriptive in this. You just need a hook to hang everything on, and then the the other things like the nature of the transit can go into the work items that um, you know that, that flesh it out and, and make it buildable as opposed to aspiration. I, I love this. I think it's it's better than the previous one but doesn't lose anything. Add, certainly add some pieces. We could add the connected neighborhoods if we wanted to. Because we have, you know, like the river corner to some place we can just put um, connecting <coughs> corridors, connecting neighborhood corridors, or I don't know. Connect our community is yeah. good, right where you put it. So. Oh, I didn't know what you were saying. And she yeah. just did it. <laughs> <laughs> it just happened. Yeah, because you connect our economic development corridor or our business areas and our main street and our neighborhoods. And I think if you just said resident residents, then it 
business schools that mm -hmm. because I think that because I think that goes back to the Olympic transportation piece and kind of anchor on first name, top of the street, what are we trying to do on rails, looking at other transportation options that really is about connecting our communities. It doesn't sound right here though when you have and and joys. Um, what would be better is there's a vibrant Main Street and a river corridor that connects our community to or while while using or while enjoying. I don't okay. know if options enjoy or maybe community period we will enjoy. Well, we enjoy. Or 100% renewable are definitely different. I mean, those are definitely different concepts. Yeah, they're, they're different things. Or it could say something like 100% renewable energy will power, you know, the community with constant consideration of climate change or something. I mean, there's other ways. I know that it's a consideration. I mean, the plan is very active. <laughs> I mean, well, I get what, you, I get yeah. what, I get what you're yeah. saying. I mean, we prioritize, or how about uh, of climate change over time connecting our community to a vibrant Main Street and River Corridor? Is that is too wordy? Yeah. So, so along with quality of life and economic vitality, includes the mobility options that connect our community. We enjoy 100% renewable power while addressing the effects of climate change over time. There is a vibrant Main Street and River Corridor that stretches from Sugarloaf to Fairgrounds that is residential, cultural, and energy for half a century. Sustainable under Scott's natural environment. Which is? Which is sustainable. Yeah, that means a verb. Or, yeah. And then Valerie pointed out we don't need to say our vision is because it says we're planning this division. <laughs> See, yeah. absolutely. Sorry, I'm yeah. a journalism degree, so I'm going to knock I appreciate it. <laughs> We can't control the higher dollars. This we have some ability to make happen. We can't, we have no, we have no control records. No. <laughs> no. We do have control over controlling them in the sense that um, if we create barriers to migration, that's controlling them. And respecting the natural environment means we don't create those barriers. Um, yes, that. I think for me that's getting into operations. Well, no, I don't want to say that. I'm just saying natural environment is I, 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 I think it includes a lot. Yeah. To your question, John, I think it does include a lot of time. So with, with, just to kind of give you a sense, the work that you all did in 2020 when you put this together, for those of you who were here, if you remember, I think it took us a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. That was actually 2008. In 2008, yeah. We modified in 2020, we added a couple of words. From the people, we added the reference to entire life for adults. Right? We also added the 100% renewable energy at that point. But in 18, if you remember, it took us a long time to kind of get to this and, and I think now we're starting to see how we can just we're just going to tweak this as we're moving forward. I, that was a mm -hmm. really it was really neat for me to watch you all move through this. Maybe it's just me that can it's just me that deep breath. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. This is something that we should remember like when we go people ask you but you know what's long run? You know, where's long run and everything and and then this this is something that is that elevator speech that we kind of you know, break. You could print them a little business cards front and back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and everybody, you know, like, like those little constitutions. Well, yeah. 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 
Yeah. I will tell you, you know, we just brought in uh, the Moto communication company to come and help us with our strategic communication plan for sustainability. When they read all the information, everything that Long Run is giving, all the different awards and all these things, that both both consultants were like, maybe we should be, and then high speed awesome. internet. But both consultants were like, maybe we should be doing operations to Long Run. Yes, yes, we think yes, Come on. <laughs> so we can put the new one up on the website like right away, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I will. Uh, I will hit save and at the break, I'll send it right up on the website right away. Okay, I'm going to turn it back over to Harold to talk a little bit about vision and goals. And Valerie's going to help as well. Um, well, I mean, I talked about this yesterday. So, why are we setting these goals? It's really taking that, looking at the vision, and then working on short term motivation where we're all rowing in the same direction. I think that was the thing that when I talked to you all yesterday about what my need were and what we needed as we're balancing core operations is really being in lockstep with each other in terms of are we rowing in the same direction. Now, that may mean at times that we think here's where we're going, but the world changes around us and we have to adjust. Doesn't mean we're gonna go perpendicular. It means we're gonna go at a diagonal because we have to make adjustments. And oh, navigation. Pardon? Oh, navigation. It's navigation, yeah, it is. It's really. Um, and that's actually a good word. You know, we're navigating with, um, you know, it's kind of riffing on what I said yesterday, the tumultuous waters that we're all experiencing, and I think will continue. Um, it also lets us get faster, and we can build the accountability. And um, when we have the focus, we can get faster, and when we manage what's on us, then it lets us really hit these things hard and fast, but we can, um, next year hopefully say here's everything that we did because we can focus so if the metaphor rather than rowing was sailing mm -hmm. like we're a crew even great navigators can make headway or can stay on course in headwinds right by right. being in adapting mm -hmm. in the environment <laughs> Johnny's a rower and she um, so Harold's the coxswain of the eight-week uh, yeah. boat, right? So he's pulling the cords to Steve. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, after uh, about an hour of me presenting to you all yesterday, talking about the different challenges we have, you know, we, we ended with this slide. And once again, I'm going to kind of go back a little bit because we have more people in the room today. Uh, when we said what are my operational goals, unyielding focus on our core services, addressing staffing challenges in the labor market, and making data-driven decisions and project management. I gave you some, I gave you three. Uh, it's also having, you know, creating financial stability and sustainability for the organization, being as efficient and effective as we possibly can, but I didn't want to take up too much room in this. Um, and then we talk about, based on what you all have already put in this, what were my operational goals last year and what am I seeing in terms of the operational, or, you know, so how do you see the future? We said housing, uh, which included the housing authority, because we can't untangle that from you, and we can't untangle that from the organization, because many of the same people are doing the same work. <coughs> Affordable and attainable housing. Um, we talked about equity and sustainability and climate action. Uh, obviously, you see steam downtown area, sugar mill. Uh, that is tying into your vision that you just talked about. We could probably add Main Street onto that too, based on what uh, we're working on with Kimberly. Uh, transportation and then early childhood. As I'm thinking about this, you all said, let's work off of this today so we can really define what that's going to look like and how we're going to move through it. Um, and I was, as I was listening to the conversations, I'll put some back to this one. I had a, 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 a piece. I think one of the things that we often struggle with um, as staff as we're moving through these topics is which one of these variables is actually the top priority for us? Um, and you heard, you kind of heard me talk about that when we discussed housing. 
to say what is our North Star and, and what is going to be the primary. Um, if we rank these in, in rank order, what is number one? Because there are a lot of times where these will start competing against each other from time, from a time perspective, uh, from a financial perspective, and we have to make choices. Marcia? I was about to say we can't make choices. I think what we have is two priorities, operational core services and everything else, which is sustainable growth. So rather than um, saying we're going to drop early childhood uh, or drop transportation, what we're going to, we, we need to um, keep them moving in lockstep, even if it means we have to slow everything down, because none of them work without the other one. And, and I, that's a good point. I think what, what, you know, if we take the housing conversation, you know, yesterday I said, who's all working on housing? And <coughs> you know, even those that didn't, didn't raise their hand, virtually everybody's touching it. So I guess my question is, if I get into a point where I have a situation from a capacity standpoint, financial standpoint, where I, I have a decision to make operationally, is it housing or is it steam? The more clear I am in terms of your rank priorities, the easier it is for me to make those operational decisions real time, because that happens. See, I disagree with, with what Marsha just said about lockstep, and they're all the same. Uh, I, for me, um, I, don't, I don't know how, if, if we solve the housing problem without the child care issue, we, I mean, the, the whole question of what's a living wage and right. economic uh, you know, viability in one month, we've just, we've lost the second part of the major variable, right? Those things, I think, have to go together. And I think those things are more immediate. I mean, we've got to continue addressing climate over the long run. We don't have a lot of control over transportation. Right now. We have way more control over a lot of them, but more control over some of these variables than others. And some are more urgent or, I don't know, uh, uh, viable to, 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 to affect in the short term than others in terms of the long run. I, I, I want to understate the importance of, of either transportation or the environment, but we have way more opportunity to make an impact on the other two in the short run than transportation or climate change. I think that it's a matter of how things are addressed. Um, I, I don't think that what Tim said actually contradicted what I said. You, know, you may think so too, <laughs> but um, the thing is that if you, if you don't provide all, all of the needs in the human basket, then something's going to break. And I think it's more a matter of approach. I, I have the strongest memory of the first piece of actual operational um, instruction that I got from you, the first thing you ever taught me, Harold Dominguez, was about public-private partnerships. So some of these things uh, are things that can only be done by the city, the operations, you know, and, I mean, even now, because of Tabor, we've adapted to a model where infrastructure is inherently a public-private partnership. And so, um, you know, we know it works. We know that in some ways it's the only way we have to make forward progress. So what we need to understand, need to learn better, is how we uh, address some of these essential needs by bringing in the private, as opposed to um, things that have to actually be run top down, um, like next slide and Longmont Power, 
and you know the water treatment systems and stuff that, that have to work operationally because they're poor. Um, but all the other stuff can can be a partnership. I think it can. I think it's a, it's a different level of work and where the work sits and what you have to do. So on, on developing public-private partnerships, the front-end work is exhaustive in what you have to do. So it takes a lot of bandwidth on the front-end. Where it saves you on the bandwidth is on the back-end. Uh, but putting those together um, takes a lot of time. So um, I can use the analogy on the, uh, on the housing work that we're doing. Um, the work that we've done on uh, Christman and on Zinnia and now on Hoover, those are public-private partnerships of which we're not, we're putting in a little bit of money, but not a lot. The time that's required to develop those um, is, is in the hundreds of hours uh, in terms of building the financial package, understanding you know, the capital stack, everything we talked to you about. And so what I was trying to get at is the more I can understand how you all are seeing these lined up in I'm not saying we stop it. I think that probably wasn't clear. I'm not saying we stop it, but when we have three housing public-private partnerships or something that we're working on, and somebody comes in because we see this, I mean, you all hear it all the time. This is in your vision. This is in your work plan. You need to do this, but we're doing a lot of things in your vision and your work plan, and. It, it would help me um, to work with everyone is if I understood at, at the 30,000 feet, what's your priority on this? So that as we're making real time decisions and we have three housing projects going and someone comes in and says, oh, we want to do this at the sugar mill. You know, I can say, I get it and we're, we can do this, but it's going to go slow because I need to go fast on these things. And understanding that right order helps me make those pace decisions that you referenced. I think we all might have slightly different ranges. And that's why I wanted to have this conversation here because that's where we struggle is the different rankings on the individual. And, and I need a holistic ranking from the council so that I know that I'm really addressing in order when there's competing interests. There are times when we may not ever compete, but in those seven, at those times when we compete, what is your order? And Harold, you're talking about these five, right? Yep. The community housing, equity, sustainability, climate change, steam, transportation, early childhood. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we can figure, sorry, a lot of times we can figure it out and we're moving. I mean, you saw the downtown corridor where, you know, we had folks working but this was really a pinch for us, time us. Um, you know, there, there are opportunities that come around that we can't mm -hmm. not take because they're time bound. Mm -hmm. Costco is a good example of that. <coughs> we knew what we were going to lose in revenue, we knew what we were going to gain. And we were really fighting against the loss revenue stream. Had we not have taken that and run with it at that point in time, it's not like that opportunity will exist in the future. So there's that piece of the decision making process of which we talked about with you all real time. There are other times where we just get into these pinches of do we get this housing project done or do we spend time working on this? And, and understanding as a body where you all sit really helps this team inform our decisions in terms of A or B when we're pinched from a capacity standpoint. I'm concerned with having the word equity appear on any one of these line items, especially not in the housing line item. So, you know, all of the bullets under housing are directly related to quality of life equity. Um, and yes, you know, climate action is preservation of equity because the worst are Worse our environment is um, the less equity we have because the people who don't have the agency to escape will sit in it. Um, 
But, um, you know, all of it is about equity. Childhood action is about equity because I blocked whatever the school system didn't provide for my child. But some people can't do that. Yeah, it's, you, you raise a good point. Both equity and I mentioned Lisa, sustainability are woven through everything that we do. So maybe this one really is more specific on 100% of our relationship with all our climate change. Because the equity and sustainability should be and, and you could actually you could actually move that up into operational. We don't want to miss it. Yeah. You it's could move that into the operational, but here's the difference. Uh, when when we talk about equity and sustainability, it is something we're working on operationally, but we talk about it in terms of building it in into the DNA of the organization. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that it becomes part of everything that we do. That's my operational goal. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about is Council in terms of equity and sustainability in terms of your council goal because mine is inward facing If you put equity and sustainability into it, that's a different perspective You're also saying yes inward, but also outward facing in terms of how we engage in the community and so there's a difference in terms of where that sits because if it's my operational goal, I can go to the organization and say, here's my goal, here's what we need to do. I can't necessarily go to the community and say, here's my operational goal because I'm not the policy maker. You all are the policy maker. So, I'm not sure what you mean by inward and outward. I mean, running this, you know, thousand person operation as as an equitable and sustainable organization is one thing, but that's very micro. There are other operational things. It's internal. Yeah, that's internal. It's internal. Yeah, that's internal. Um, which shouldn't be a climate uh, a council goal at all, right? But um, we should be able to assume it. But but the um, um, equity operational equity is stuff like um, the. Horizontal infrastructure is older and crummier and less adequate to the future in the worst neighborhoods, in the less at least economically viable neighborhoods that we have. And that is a huge inequity because people will be left behind. Should there be part of a vision statement or something that is an overall statement rather than you have it you, in a vision? I don't think you need to repeat that in everything that we address. It's how we prioritize. Does it work okay like this? What we're saying is equity and sustainability is throughout operational as we, as we implement? Well, that's why I asked what that meant. Yeah. And I think it, for me, and I'm just going to tell you for me, and I know there's some others that have their hands up. For me, even internally when I get into this, what, what I can anchor on when I talk about equity and sustainability is not only is it my goal, it's the council's goal. Because you do get pushback on this. And so I think not having that as part of your goals, um, where if you just push it in the operational piece, it does create challenges. It also creates challenges when we're talking to the community. And they go, well, why are you doing this? And so I don't want to leave, even if we ask for it in the operational piece, but we just agree that that is both a city council goal and an operational goal because we do know when we talk about equity there are two pieces to this Carmen and I talk about this all the time I can work the internal side of it and really bring the training and everything we need but there is going to be a point where we have to start working the external side of it within the community and I, if I don't have that policy direction as part of this then that's going to you know, be a bit of a rub down the road. But now, do you agree that that's not necessarily an item to be prioritized? Correct. It is something that we need affirmation that that's the city's council yeah. policy. It needs to be suffused yeah. in everything yeah. that, that happens. It's not a rankable okay. one. It's not a rankable one, but it's I just need to know you, you all are on board, and this is also your goal as well as my goal. That way, when we hit those tension points, you know, it's that classic phrase, you know, when you go right behind you and then you turn around and it's like, whoa. <laughs> and, and that's part of why I wanted to dig into this because I think we all know where we are um, in 
what we're seeing nationally in these conversations we're seeing them in our community and I don't want to outrun in your headlights if that's not something you want. Let's give Carol the thumbs up that we if we want that equity and sustainability throughout. Absolutely. Yeah, this is this is two yeah. thumbs up. I, I think none of us wants to do anything about that in isolation. It shouldn't be done in isolation. It should be embedded in all of that's what that's what makes it tough. Yeah, right. right. It's not really breakable. No. It should be implemented throughout all of the yes. work that we get. Yeah. And it varies depending on what the um, what the project is or what the issue is, right? But in fact, that's the case. So I know there were some other hands raised back here, so I want to. I thought my computer was about to die. I didn't want to borrow yours. Now I didn't think someone would want to use it. Oh. Keep talking. Keep talking. I'll check it out on the computer. Okay, so for me, I totally, I mean, I felt from the beginning that equity should is embedded in everything that that's the lens we are looking for. Mm -hmm. Okay. I I mean that's what I thought was happening anyway. Um as far as prioritizing housing, you know, being a single mom, my kids are, are older now. Thank goodness I don't have to deal with what younger families have to deal with with affordable housing and affordable child care. I feel like that's equal. Um, coming from the perspective of a single a parent, you know, um, you have to have affordable housing and you also have to have affordable child care as well. Um, to me, they're on the equal plane. Like, we should be busting tail to try to make sure we can uh, accommodate our uh, residents with that. Um, I don't know if, I think that's, for me, that's priority. I don't know if that's something we can say, we can have them equal like that. But at least for the first priority, for me, I think we should go one, you know, first, second, third, however you want to do it, I'm just going with what I feel that's we should work on. Uh, that's priority for me. Just so that we can get started on it, because okay. I know we're kind of, going elsewhere so we can I know you have other stuff for us to do. Um, if we can have that discussion, I would love to hear what my other council members would like to say on that. Can you rank the others? If you said housing and child care are equal. Yeah, um, transportation for sure, because that's another thing. Um, Transportation and of course 100% affordable. All of that, like Marsha said, kind of it all comes together. But I know the priority. So steam, um, the sugar mill is on the bottom for me because we're looking at essentials. If it, if you don't have, okay, so if I'm working and I need a place to stay that's affordable and the only place I can, you know, if I'm working, I can't live where I work and child care is too expensive but then my city is is really encouraging me not to drive a car but then the bus system don't go everywhere I work we have a problem so how do we we need to address all those issues together so those are my priorities okay. so um Thanks, Shakira. You, you said much of what I was going to. <laughs> I don't know how we can address housing, which I think is the priority, without addressing transportation. When we talk about LHA and building uh, residence, residences for people who either can't drive or um, can't afford to drive, then we have to address transportation. When we're talking about building an urban society, and we do not address transportation at the same time, then I think we are not building a holistic city. Um, so I, I disagree that this is out of our control. I think that's a message that we have been given by other entities, by, by states and uh, counties that home rural cities cannot control because we belong in a district. So some of these things I think we can work 
are being worked on in parallel, not necessarily with the cities doing everything. For example, um, childcare. It's been worked. It's being worked on in parallel with, and we'll see where it goes with asking for an early childhood district. It may not be something that the city has to put time into right now, but we need to support the effort that in parallel that is being worked on. Um, the same thing might be, so I think transportation needs to be moved up. Um, because we can't, again, I, I know I'm beating the drum, but we can't say it's out of our control. We have to make sure that everybody in this county knows that we are going to take control over our city transportation and make it work so that the way we are building our city works. And um, that is being worked on right now and it's being worked on in parallel. So um, we, just, we just need to make sure that we are all on board that if we're gonna build this way, we need to make sure that we can travel this way. Um, the other thing is that I, I think skiing basically is kind of out of the city council's control. That should be up to the staff on where that is prioritized. If you have the time to work on it, then do it. But if you don't, these other things are probably need to be prioritized. Um, so for me, it's housing front and center, along with transportation and support the early childhood uh, parallel path that this kind of trying to go on. What would it be helpful? You know, when we talk about, when I said about what we have control of, I, that their mindset about those aspects of transportation that are more like RTD ride. But we do have a lot of input. I, I get, I'm talking about it far more broadly. So it would be helpful for me to kind of tease out which parts of, of a transportation solution we control and, and that, you know, we factor into budgeting and are actionable for us. Those things on which we don't have a lot of control. But, so I just want to acknowledge uh, that there, I, I get there are things okay. that we well, but, but I think Joan is right. The picture is changing yeah. there. Um, but the point I was trying to make um, is, is, is that there are, there are things that we can let go of by um, changing the control points um, and things that we can't. So, for example, we prioritize early childhood by by backing the special district um, because we already don't do a huge amount of actually doing the work. You know, we fund and we engage with some independent agencies that provide oversight. If, if Christina is that kind of a correct model. You know, we have organizations like Bright Eyes that are not city operations that keep us informed of where the pain points are. And that is a whole different thing than something like NextLight, where we put in the infrastructure and we run it and we enhance it and, and we do all of it. So maybe before we prioritize, we should be able to, we, we should put these things in two columns. You know, honestly, STEAM is the same way. We enable those things to happen, but then somebody else is going to actually do it. There's a lot of front work on, on development side that the staff is involved in. Yes, it's and, true. And uh, I guess that was my point. If you feel you don't have a bandwidth to do that, for me, that has to go down. I just had a thought about that when you say equities and sustainability throughout the NCMA that right under as a major bullet point under operation, should then housing uh, and all these kind of shift to the right uh, because they're all going to fall under uh, under that because that's the, the concept. Is that the one? And, and what I'm saying by equity and sustainability throughout is really. Uh, the analogy I use is the organization is embedded in the DNA, meaning everything we do. Uh, it's a lens. So the analogy I use when I'm talking to the organization and looking at Carmen, because we do a lot of this together, 
the analogy I use in the organization, it's like if you're, have you ever seen National Treasure? Mm -hmm. So the, the Benjamin Franklin glasses where you have the different lenses? Mm -hmm. It's where you always have the lens of equity and sustainability over your glasses, so no matter what we're doing. It's practice. first and front and center, DNA becomes practice, it becomes automatic in what we do. Just like it's automatic for efficiencies and effectiveness. I mean, that's what everybody tends to focus on. This is really creating that automatic response of how is this addressing equity? How is this addressing sustainability? So that seems to me that this you have to be calm and everything should shift to the right, even under the operation. Uh, based on what you just said, it seems that that would be the logical uh, thing that everything, it's even on the operational side of things, should be, uh, should fall underneath that sustainability based on, on that type of thinking. Yeah. You know, to that point, though, because um, we're talking about goals, and if we think about equity, sustainability, is there a way that each of us, operational owners, should come back and say, here are our goals, here's what we're going to implement? Okay. Because I think, yeah, we need to be very specific about it. Well, you can you know, you know, you know, you know, the work we just kind of went through why I need you to do it is, is really a big help to me, because then I'm going back, we're already doing this. We want equity. We want equity and sustainability goals. But I can now look at these folks and go, all right, they're doing it. But here's where we're going. It's embedded in everything. And when I get pushback, because I do get pushback, I can go. It's not only my goal as as the, the city manager. It's the council's goal. And my job is to make sure your goals are addressed. And and that gives me that helps me when I'm having this conversation. I'm going to kind of help you a little bit, Aaron. Um, well, I, would, I, would, I would thought, I guess, is that I don't know if I rank them by importance because they're all very important, mm -hmm. right? I rank them based on how much can we affect versus uh, the need to work with a private partner. Um, for instance, the steam downtown area, that's heavily reliant on downtown partnerships and seems to be more of the flexibility to address an opportunity when one comes along, right? Versus housing, where now obviously LHA uh, is much more um, under the purview of the commission, uh, which is more internalized in the city, right? Um, I think, as, as we talked about early childhood, there's opportunities, but again, that's a lot of partnerships that we have to control. So, with transportation, I think that there are opportunities to bring. Uh, things within internal to the organization in the sense that some of the most connected municipalities out there are part of multiple authorities to to get the holistic system to work um, so they'll be a part of a regional district like we are but then they'll also have the certain things that are operated at a more municipal level or intracity travel and so i think there are opportunities for us it's going to you know we're not going to be able to provide those those kinds of services for free. Obviously, there will have to be some like, unlike our current fare buyout that we're doing with RTD. I think we will have to go back to charging fares for these things. But you know that I think if there the opportunity level there to have internal control over a significant section of, of our safe mobility options could could prioritize that up depending on council direction, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of, I would rank them based on how much control we have over them. Okay. Or how much control we must or take. Or must take. Yeah, because, uh, you know, the privatization I mean, uh, still has brought in, it has located some incredibly innovative private providers that we could partner with under, um, RTD's new rules that we really haven't seen yet, but you guys are already on it. Um, so, uh, you know, we can make that easier, require less oversight by the city versus, um, you know, the wastewater system. Ain't nobody going to do that for us. We have to use a stick to get the builders to start it off right. You know, um, so those things are always going to be really labor intensive for the city, um, even when we try to push it out onto the landowners. 
how it works. So um, I, I think that yeah, Aaron and I are on the same page on that, and that we should we should rank these things into columns versus um, about labor intensity and the requirements for control versus our ability to let go. I see here on wave columns on the screen. Yeah. Anything you're you're getting at some of it, Susie? Any ideas? I know now that I'm rethinking, because you know, because I was looking at priorities, but Aaron had a good point about, uh, you know, so like I'm thinking about steam downtown. I mean, that is heavily dependent on, like, you're not actively going out there and seeing this through alone. It's really the building that partnership. So that's that's kind of dependent. You know, my priorities are housing, childcare, you know, and then, you know, but it, it is, it's hard to rank because they're all so very important. You depend upon each other. And depend upon each other for so, success. So maybe if you think about it this way, because we do move these things mm -hmm. all at the same time. If if one of these came against another and I go to you all and say, we're Max, mm -hmm. which one? Do you want me to focus on? Um, Which one would you want me to focus on? I think it would depend for me upon how much traction you made in each area. You know, one that is taking longer, whatever you can accomplish fastest in whatever is, you know, for me, <coughs> how long that is. So it's the opportunities go up. That's right. What yeah. yeah. Right. 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 Um, the other thing is, uh, there's this idea of enablement that I don't think is, is, Giving, being given enough weight yet. So, for example, housing, okay? We focus money and supervisory time and stuff on housing if at the same time we get the, the planners are saying, well, almost everything is mixed use. You can have some corner stores, you can have um, restaurants and, and, and you know, little entertainment things like arcades. Anywhere in the housing neighborhood, as long as you know you, you do it in a way that's not gonna break the neighborhood, then the private sector will come in and ensure that we have a certain aspect of livability in our neighborhoods. Um, whereas if we have really rigid um, zoning like, like single family, uh, you don't get that, and you get you get food deserts, and you get automobile dependency, and all of that stuff. So, by by using modern uh, zoning philosophies, you know, we we can let go of some of these priorities, and they will happen by themselves because we create opportunity. I see all of these kind of like a uh, group of ladders on the wall. Some are further along to the top of the, the, the roof line than others. And uh, when you come and talk to us and say, we can complete this aspect of it, uh, that seems like a good priority goal to me. Uh, and in that sense, that's why I, I kind of think that what is further along, what is in our, uh, uh, in our ability to actually to finish it or to, to uh, come to a conclusion on at least one of the projects uh, it seems to be uh, a good way of approaching it, and that is to deal with, with housing and affordable and attainable, and also uh, transportation. Maybe thinking outside the box on, on certain things and recognizing, uh, you know, what is going to be attractive to the, the population of Longmont over what seems to not be so attractive to the population. Um, again, I want to stress. I think everything should fall under the equity and sustainable throughout, mm -hmm. uh, even your operational aspect, because that sends such a strong message. Because it sends a strong message to the uh, every employee from the, the assistant center managers down uh, uh, to the, the new hire, and uh, and it also sends an outward message to all of the um, folks in Longmont that we're going to do that in a time when. That has been a Achilles heel for a lot of communities. 
where they have forgotten about that uh, and uh, gotten themselves in a lot of trouble over that. That should be the, the one thing that, as you said, you know, runs throughout the whole uh, uh, that whole uh, program here. And so I, I would put that that above operational. And again, shift everything to the right, and then talk about the priorities within that scope because everything is about equity and sustainability throughout. Thank you for that. I, I agree. But it also sends a message to any um, commercial entity that wants to get to our city. This is this is what we focus on throughout everything. So when you want to come into our city, this is this is priority for us in everything that we've done. We can't I mean, you do what you want to do, but so we have a little bit of time left and I haven't heard from Kim. Heard a little bit. I heard uh, housing and early childhood. Well, I'll reiterate. <clears throat> I, I, I think I've heard echoes of what I tried to say earlier in terms of how much how much control we have, those things that, that we can do something about. Part of my frustration, for example, with the 100% renewable energy goal, not that that is the righteous goal, but as I recall, some, as we saw the other night, a huge percentage of what we're going to be able to accomplish in the last two years is totally dependent upon PRPA. Right? So, not that we wouldn't you know, focus on this, but if I had to make a choice between housing and, and child care, and I, and I would make the case again, everything we've talked about up here in terms of equity, housing, and child care, and I would discount transportation as the three biggest uh, differences we could make in terms of that, a more equitable community. We won't stabilize in an, in an economically uh, viable. We're not going to stabilize a workforce. You know, we're not going to see the kind of economic development we'd like to see if we don't solve or at least make progress in the housing and catch child care funds. Uh, and there's tons of data to support that. So, um, so in terms of the, the rank order, I kind of I, I, I think I steam as much as I love the, you know the visioning process. Those are totally op, kind of opportunistic. Right. I agree with Joe. We don't have a lot of control. And, but I do think we ought to have a sharp vision so when somebody brings a proposal, we can, we can both signal what we, you know, what that is. And when somebody brings a proposal, we can make decisions relatively quickly about does it fit or not. If it doesn't, come back later when you have something that, that aligns with what we what we expect or we aspire to see in our community. But the basics for me are really clear. And I understand if I, this conversation goes back to some degree to what you suggested at the end of your presentation yesterday or at some point about organized abandonment or permission to stop doing some things. This tees that, I hope, tees up what you're able to say no to, to us or to somebody else. Make sure you open, but in, here's what I heard when I was watching head nods and people were talking. Housing, child care, transportation, and some component are foundational. The others are there, we continue working on those. Uh, and I have the ability to then come in operationally and go, here's where we are, here's our capacity, with, with sort of those three sitting at, at the pinnacle of what we need to focus on. Is that a fair statement that you all agree with? Thumbs up. Yes, for me. Sort of. <laughs> well, so we've sort of come to the idea of cross-cutting attributes. We don't do anything without preserving equity and sustainability as we do it. And I would like to add climate action to that. It's a cross-cutting attribute. And I would also like to add Vision Zero as a cross-cutting attribute, you know, because safe is is the main attribute of the transit priority, which is an activity that the city does. So you get this, and and climate is the same way because um, because there is such an equity penalty to ignoring that. Um, you know, not to mention the whole thing of future generations, but for people alive today, there's such an equity penalty to doing it. So I think, Harold, you've got a matrix. You know, you've got um, the ways that the city, how much control the city must exert 
but then we've got this paradigm or framework that everybody who comes in and works with us has to has to has to how. abide by. I think it's how and how we do yeah. things, and it's a why, but it's not a what. And the goal should be the what. Yeah. And I think we, as we get into now diving into these individually, we can get at it because I'm going to bring some tensions that are coming to play within these individual goals. When if, if something's cross cutting within the goal itself, where do you start choosing? Because there are choices in this. In, and we have to go to the next session, but the example I'll give you, you can build 100 housing units and you bring in some of these uh, components in terms of you know, renewable energy and distributed energy and it takes it from you can build 100 units or you can't build 100 units just because of the ad, what starts waiting, because that's the reality for us as we're looking at housing projects. And, and there will be choices in that. Yeah, and remember the SES. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you, you've got a way in. If it's a difference between you can't build it without it's being sustainable, then maybe you have to build it anyway. But if it's a distinction between 98 units or 100 units, but we don't ruin our um, demand profile yeah. on PRPA, build the 98, not the 100. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm talking the extreme. Yeah. Okay. I'm good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, why don't we go ahead and take a five minute break? Our next conversation will be the dive into the roadmaps around uh, electrification, climate emergency work, and 100% renewable energy. <laughs> so I know we have a bunch of presenters that will be coming up. So go ahead and take a little five minute break. And okay. So we're going to continue on with the agenda um, for our retreat. But one thing I'd like you to think a little bit about. Um, is now that you've given, um, you know, certainly that was a great conversation, by the way, around which things need to happen, what things we have control over, um, you know, which things we just need to seize opportunities around. But I'd like for you to think a little bit about what does success look like? What does success look like in each of those five areas? So now you have these five areas, housing, early childhood, transportation, the 100% renewable energy, climate action, beneficial electrification, and speed. What does success look like? We're going to come back to that, but we're going to actually start with the 100% Renewable Energy Climate Action Beneficial Electrification, because that's where our agenda says we're going to go on. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to Susan and Lisa, who are going to uh, give you a presentation. At the end of that presentation, and depending on how timing looks like, I'm going to ask you what the success looks like in this area first, and transportation, which is also part of the presentation. And then we'll come back to housing. So we may flip around a little bit, because we have to make sure we are accommodating a giant fire truck. Um, you know, in the middle of all this, but I would uh, like that's what I'd like for you to kind of start to think about in your minds as we move forward. Okay, Lisa, I'll turn it over to you and Susan. Okay. All right, good morning, Mayor Peck and members of Council. Lisa Nabok, Sustainability Manager with Strategic Integration. I'm here today with my colleague Susan Bartlett from the LPC, uh, and we're going to be getting into the climate emergency resolution and resulting roadmaps and work that have come out of that. If you, I know that the sound can be kind of weird in here, so if you all can't hear me at any point in time, please just wave or, or holler at me. Uh, so just to quickly ground us in the, in the foundational uh, components of the climate emergency resolution, which as you all re remember was passed in 2019, uh, the primary focus was really taking immediate and accelerated action to address the climate crisis. And council appointed the Climate Action Task Force, which was responsible for developing the recommendations to accelerate climate action. And it also called for engaging frontline communities in the planning decision and implement implementation, which happened through the Just Transition Plan Committee, which ran concurrently. The Climate Action Task Force came up with their recommendations in the six topic areas here, which we went over a little bit on Tuesday, with the foundation being equity, so really that understanding that all of our climate action work has to really consider and, and look at the equity impacts as well as the opportunities that we can build into all of this work. And then all of those recommendations came together to be the Climate Action Recommendations Report. This is just a quick refresher of what you all saw on Tuesday. So when we talk about accelerating climate action, um, that's looking at the two components, reducing our, our greenhouse gas emissions. So we went through on Tuesday the results from our 2021 inventory, 
showing that our primary emissions come from electricity, natural gas, and transportation. So that's really what we will be focusing on today. And then also the adaptation side, so making sure we're preparing our community for the impacts of climate change. This is just a slide to show that this work doesn't happen in isolation, and a lot of the conversation you all were, were just talking about really speaks to that. That there's a lot of work that's housed in these various plans uh, that, that's taken on by departments across the organization. So one of the foundational plans being Envision Longmont, the comprehensive plan that has the primary tenets of sustainability and resilience. Obviously the sustainability plan, which includes all of the recommendations from the greenhouse gas report, and also the transportation roadmap, which we'll talk just a little bit about briefly shortly. The climate action recommendations report, which uh, overlaps with a lot of work, the work from the sustainability plan. And one of those recommendations specifically was the beneficial building electrification plan, which Susan will get into shortly. And then of course, one of the driving uh, goals really being that transition to 100% renewable electric energy supply by 2030. So that I'm gonna hand it to Susan to get into those items and then we'll circle back. So, Mayor Peck, Council Members, I'm Susan Bartlett. I'm the Director of Energy Strategies and Solutions at LPC. Thanks for letting us talk today. Um, it was good and interesting to hear your conversation on the 100% renewable uh, electric supply goal. It's, it's important information for us. But I um, just wanted to talk a little bit about that and, and where we are and how it supports some of the things that Lisa talked about with the sustainability plan and the Climate Action Recommendation Report. And it's gonna take a concerted effort for us to achieve this goal. And part of that is intrinsically related to the Rivers goal for 100% carbon-free electricity by 2030. And I just wanted to um, bring to your attention some of the things that are underway at that utility scale level with um, new solar coming on board at Black Hollow, that's in Wealth County. There's also an RFP that's out for utility scale solar and storage. They're looking at other um, uh, evaluation tools around how to use storage and length of dispatchability and where's the best place to put that. Looking at potential wind projects. And interestingly, and probably more effective for us, uh, well, <coughs> effective for us because it all ties together, but they're doing a potential study looking at the impact of distributed energy resources, so solar and battery and all of our devices, uh, as well as the added load of electric vehicles and building electrification. So they're doing a, a potential study, both at the generation scale uh, and also looking at some distri distribution level impacts. And then we'll be doing some forecasting. We're working closely with them on that. Uh, Platte River is also getting ready to join the Southwest Power Pool, and that's an energy market to kind of help us with resiliency and to manage um, a, a dynamic supply in the future. So we're excited about that. And all of the things over here on the left, um, I think of this as a, as a yes and endeavor. Sorry, um, Susan, I just lowered the light so people could see in the back. I didn't want to start over you or think oh. something had happened. <laughs> All good. Yes. All good. Thanks. Um, so, so Flat River is is working hard on its end. We have to do our part, and the things on the left are, uh, you know, kind of the big the big categories of areas that we're working on the hundred percent renewable goal, as well as reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So, I wanted to share some things that we're doing locally, in addition to what Flat River is doing. We are talking with Platte River uh, about um, areas on our distribution grid where we might locate battery storage um, to help with some resilience and help us to learn how to use that technology. Uh, we're looking at an RFP for solar on city facilities. This year, uh, we keep hearing more and more about other opportunities where we have buildings that might benefit from solar. And we continue to de develop uh, um, a model for a subscription service for community solar here in Longmont. I wanted to bring up the solar and storage list of the wastewater treatment plant. Um, this is a project that actually includes uh, energy efficiency with some new equipment that's going in, new blower equipment that's going in, plus solar, plus storage, and it's a city facility so we get to benefit from all the data and all the, the learning that's going to happen there. 
And then um, Daryl and his team at LPC is working on a smart grid roadmap. And what that's going to do is help us kind of understand our own distribution grid a little bit better, as well as understand the impacts of these distributed energy resources that are going to come onto our grid in the future and making sure that um, we understand what the two strengths are, but we also understand what the potential is. This summer also we're going to look at rates uh, through a little bit of a different lens. We, we want to be able to equate the value of solar on our system, the value of demand and response where people can um, provide some variability in their use of our energy and determine uh, rates that support and promote programs that help us manage our load a little better, but we also want to make sure that we're um, being equitable in how we distribute our rates among all of our rate classes. Um, and, and that's kind of a big deal this summer. And then I wanted to talk about locally installed solar. So this isn't city owned or LTC driven. It is our customers who are putting solar on their properties. Um, currently, at the, well, at the end of 2022, we had about six megawatts of installed solar. And um, that, that's just a number if you don't think about this stuff all the time, but I think what's interesting about 2022 is we had a 54% increase over all the previous years that we've been tracking. So there's definitely um, interest and uh, there are extended federal incentives and there's just a lot out there, uh, a lot of information out there about installing solar and we wanna make sure that we're uh, kind of capturing that moment and working with these customers um, as they are, as they are interconnecting with our grid, and then I wanted to, I wanted to wrap up this slide just by saying that we have not forgotten energy efficiency. That's kind of core to everything that we're working on. If we don't use it, we don't have to generate it, which helps us with our goal. And I did want to take the opportunity to talk about the beneficial building electrification plan. So council accepted the plan in October and wanted to give you a heads up of where we are and some of the strategies in the plan. And also just remind you, um, you know, Lisa had this slide before that talked about how all of these plans kind of play together and support one another. And this is part of the climate action recommendations report is that we built this plan. Um, also, I want you to think a little bit about the, the pie chart that she showed where our um, emissions, a big chunk of our emissions is related to energy use in buildings. And so um, building electrification and energy efficiency um, <coughs> will help us kind of chip away at that part of that pie. So um, we have 13 strategies in the plan. The nine that are in blue here are strategies that we're working on diligently and we have some short-term goals that we're working toward with those. The four yellow on the bottom, we haven't forgotten about, they're important, but they have a little longer runway. So we're staying plugged in regionally on what's happening in these areas so we can react quickly if we need to, but we're really focusing on this top nine. Yeah, real quick on the note of the launcher's financing. Um, Sandy and I, we were in a meeting and Joni was we were in a meeting and there's um, a local someone locally that is um, starting a project to, to deal with this issue and um, I'm scheduling a meeting so that may be something there are other discussion is that we can pull that off uh, it just happens part of a different conversation it would be great to mm -hmm. yeah. would that mean that if a private program took that over that we would not, it, it wouldn't be a constraint on our customer management system the way we have been assuming that it is. I think it's too early. It's to too tell. early to tell. I think the meeting was just Thursday. The meeting, yeah, we don't know. It's okay. just, so it's a possibility. It's a possibility. I just yeah, wanted to maybe. throw that out here because to our other conversation, that may be something that we don't necessarily take on, but we partner and that reduces the workload. So I don't want to go through each of the 13 because um, we don't have very much time today, but I did want to talk to the highlight, provide some highlights and things I'm particularly excited about. One is the electric grid evaluation. Um, as, as you all know, we have uh, advanced meter and intensive infrastructure being deployed. This is going to provide us with data we really never had before. 
uh, about our distribution grid, about how our customers use energy, uh, about how we may be able to um, deploy distributed energy resources in a way that is helpful and not uh, going to require some mitigation. Um, so this is really important uh, in terms of how we move ahead, as well as managing our increased load from those electrification and electric vehicles. Um, outreach and education. This is true for any plan that you have. One of the most important things is you help people understand what your plan is about and what you're going to do and uh, what you're going to do. Um, I think what feels complicated to me about education and outreach right now is there's so much information out there. Now, I'm submersed in this on a daily basis and I just feel like it's kind of in every direction. I don't know how that's happening in general, but there's just a lot of information about what we need to be doing and how fast and where there's money and where there's not money. You know, who's eligible for what? There's a ton of stuff. So we're trying to gather this information and condense it into um, into a format that is a little more digestible that can help um, consumers navigate that decision-making process a little bit better. And it has to start with the basics. Like what the heck is building <coughs> And how does it apply to my space? And can I afford to do it? And what are the resources? And you know, what do I do next? So we're, we're trying to narrow the pool of information to make it more useful. And we're able to do that with um, some of our partners, like Efficiency Works, and some of the efforts that are going on at the region and at the state level. But I'll say, there's so much happening in, the, in this space that sometimes regionally and at the state level, it adds more confusion. So again, we're trying to kind of condense what's available. Um, program collaboration, we talked about partnerships earlier. This is really important for um, anything we want to do on the electrification front. Our partner for rebates is Efficiency Works. They're part of Platte River, so um, they are us, and they administer our rebate programs for us and for Fort Collins, Loveland, and Estes Park as well. And they've made huge strides just in the past six months, I'd say, in really putting electrification at the top of, of their programs, primarily their residential programs. So uh, a lot of this new stuff focused on electrification is gonna go live April 1st, and that's going to include advising that really does delve into electrification. What is it? How, you know, how can I do it? Does it make sense for my house? Does it not make sense for my house? I had a contractor tell me this, but then I hear this other thing. So they're, they're building that into their advising for consumers. They're also um, really beefing up the incentives for equipment that we have, like heat pump space heating and heat pump water heating. And oh, by the way, weatherization and insulation because we want them to do that first and that's another key with the with the advisors is that I you know building electrification really isn't going to work if we get it if we get it wrong out of the gate by not having an efficiency and um, and building envelope component to go with it we have to do them in tandem otherwise um, people are going to have bad experiences on something that's kind of expensive we're also um, continuing to work with Boulder County. They have their own set of incentives. And um, you had a question. Well, it, since you interrupted, I was trying not to. But but yeah, it, are are we um, sort of meshing with these two agencies as our fulfillment, or are we going to try to push Boulder County to the side and? completely work with efficiency works and how does how does that work because they offer us some of the same services? The way that it works in long run is a little bit muddy for consumers sometimes because you can start with Boulder County or you can start with efficiency works, but what they try to do is their advisors try to coalesce the program. So by the way, you can get this from us in Boulder County, but you can also get the stacked resources from efficiency works. And that's what we're gonna to have to do with the state as well. The state will have a rebate program. Um, it was supposed to come out mid-year. Looks like it's gonna be the end of 2023 or the beginning of 2024 because the money's coming slowly from DOE. Um, and, and so we wanna make sure that whoever our 
um, advisors are that are talking to customers understand how to connect all the dots on all the programs that are available. <coughs> Um, building codes related to electrification um, are an important component. Um, Longmont is a participant in the regional uh, code cohort. We're going to have final recommendations from the cohort later this spring. Those are going to move through our code process and will be brought back to council later this year. And then I wanted to end on something that I think is really exciting. Um, and Lisa is leading this collaboration. And it's a collaboration among uh, sustainability, Longmont Power and Communications, Housing and Community Investment, Longmont Housing Authority, Efficiency Works, and potentially Energy Outreach Colorado in areas where that's going to make sense. And the objective of this demonstration is take is to take a whole home approach to improving um, income qualified residents. And so what we're looking to do is address health and safety in a home, accessibility in a home, efficiency, envelope, weatherization, those kinds of things, and then we want to electrify. And we want to do this in several different uh, housing types so that we can get <coughs> about those types of situations. Uh, we're, so we're looking at small multifamily, we're looking at mobile homes, and we're looking at single family homes that come in through our rehabilitation program here at the city. Um, it's an opportunity for us to get some data. We know it's going to be expensive, but it's not expensive. How much does it cost to bring, um, bring a home to that healthy place all around that, that's operationally sustainable over time? Um, so, so we're going to be gathering cost data. We're going to be gathering workforce data. Um, if we want to do these big projects, do we have the available labor to come in and, and help us get this work done? And then also, um, if we want to be able to scale it, um, what what does it take? What what resources do we need? And for the for the demonstration, we're applying for energy efficiency community block grant funds to help us, along with the Boulder County Sustainability Tax Funds uh, and some LPC dollars. We're also looking at whether or not this would be a good fit for the Department of Energy Buildings uh, Prize. So again, looking for a little bit more funding that we can build momentum with, and I'm pretty excited about. Uh, these are, you know, these are all building related, and um, and that's that big piece of the pie. But Lisa is also going to talk a little bit about transportation. Susan, could I just point out one thing? In terms of the housing imperative, this is a, a bigger piece of it than it sounds like because all of these lower end housing, existing housing that need to be fixed. Those buildings will become unlivable if extreme heat gets much worse. And that means we've got more housing to build. So it's, it may be expensive to change, to fix these buildings, but it's probably cheaper than building new ones. So, sorry. Thanks, Susan. And so lastly, I just want to touch on the equitable carbon-free transportation roadmap. So as you all remember from the graph, really electricity, natural gas, and transportation are our biggest sources of emissions. Uh, this was passed in 2021 uh, or completed in 2021. And just a reminder of the purpose of this document wasn't to set new goals or identify new recommendations. It was really acknowledging we have some pretty good plans on how to, how to reduce emissions from the electricity natural gas sector. We know we have a big chunk of emissions from transportation and we have some goals around reducing our transportation emissions. This was really to look at all the recommendations from the sustainability plan from Envision Longmont and how can we prioritize those, not only for reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector, but also for those equitable outcomes. And it was looking more broadly at transportation, not just EVs, like an EV readiness roadmap, because we recognize that we really have to have a robust transportation system that really makes it easy for people to get out of cars through walking and biking and rolling and access to transit and all of those things, all of the things that you all were talking about earlier. And then also electrifying our transportation system, whether those be personal vehicles, uh, car share, um, other mobility options, transit, all of those sorts of things. So I just wanted to remind folks that we have this as well. We're working through this, uh, the transportation roadmaps and then we have a big opportunity this year as, as Phil and folks are gonna be updating the transportation mobility plan. This will be rolled into that and we'll be working with Phil on that as well. 
Oh, did I lose my, lost my ability to advance for some reason. I'll try. There we go. Okay. Uh, you all saw the slide on Tuesday. This is just a, a quick synopsis in terms of how are we doing in, in implementing the, the recommendations from the Climate Action Recommendations Report. So this shows the work that's underway that we've, we've talked to you all about quite a few of these things. As I mentioned on, on Tuesday, the one area we're kind of behind in right now is education and outreach because of some staff turn turnover that we've had. So with that, I'm going to hand it off for questions and discussion with council. Lisa, could you go back to the previous slide because we didn't have a chance to read it? <coughs> Sorry about that. Yep. Thank you. Sure. We still know it's questions. <laughs> <laughs> At least the green means progress. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, very cool. Right, I'm going to take you from the <coughs> museum for the um, big picture climate act lecture series. Lecture series. Great. Yeah, it's been really great. So I guess I should have a green star there. I'm missing yeah, that one. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, more green more. stars. Yes, yeah, more green stars. Better than a gold star. A green star. <laughs> <laughs> all right, council. So we're going to fold into what you guys have been talking about, what you all have been talking about up to this point. So when you think about this work, what does Sancho Kiddo it is my kiddo. I love it. Loving the trees in the park. Yeah. He gets excited when I put photos of him. <laughs> I do too. I think he's adorable. He's an emerging star, that's for sure. Okay. So, cute. so let's go back to nope. this conversation that we started with, right? So, what does success look like? We just heard kind of a brief presentation of the roadmaps and how they're all working towards these goals. What does success look like in this particular area? And there's no right or wrong answer, we're just going to brainstorm for a few minutes. Can you go back to Lisa's slide? Which one do you want? The last one? Yes, please. Not the cute baby. <laughs> no, the baby. He is the cute baby, though. It looks like you went to your presentation, Sandy. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can fix that. I guess I have a question while we're waiting. Is there, uh, you know, we're bring, bringing out this uh, smart meters uh, plan, and do we have any concerns around unidentified uh, ADUs uh, and how they will be? Uh, impacted and how the, uh, what would be the our response? Yeah. It doesn't really kind of just curiosity. I would say <laughs> so. Our data for the meters for our customers aren't necessarily identifying whether it's a ADU or not, but it might have a address with an A or B or something like that within that, but that would already exist and be separate of the AMI, because basically it's a meter swap per meter swap versus <coughs> some other inventory change. I think though, if we're, I mean, I think if something already had an ADU, we wouldn't be able to see the difference. If all of a sudden, and we could probably just probably see the difference now, if all of a sudden you see a significant shift in electric usage, you would go, what's going on? But I think we would see that now. A little different in that it's typically the customers that bring that to our attention when they go, whoa, my bill's too high. But it may be easier to see it once we do it, but I don't know that it's gonna necessarily show us something that already exists. Right, to Harold's point, we still have monthly data now, which will have this granularity associated with a lot of the programs and policies and other things that we're trying to move forward with these goals. Was there a specific concern that you? No, I just I was just curious because that, that all of a sudden it comes out, it, uh, and people are like, 
they were keeping it kind of under their hat. They were enjoying the the, uh, the profits from it and everything. And, and now uh, there, I can see a little bit of stress in the community uh, around some of these uh, things just because of that. And you know, maybe that's uh, self-owned stress that people bring on themselves, but nevertheless stress that uh, might be uh, uh, something that we should just be kind of I guess by the simplest way to look at it, it's a swap for a swap out of the old community. And it's not any type of, let's say, policing action. We need to, um, we're going to take you back to the question. So, so Sean, what does the, the, the success look like for you? Oh, well, uh, you know, I think it, it's close to, to what we have here. Uh, you know, when, when we were looking at that stuff, there, I, I have to think of the difference between the goals of this council and the council that I served on in the past is, and how dramatic they really are. And if they were uh, looking at the climate in the country at times and how uh, sometimes people get uh, uh, thinking that somehow they're not getting the services that they want or intended or expected, that uh, they, they might try to go in a completely different direction or think that we're, we're moving too fast in a, in a uh, climate awareness uh, uh, you know, mode. And uh, I'm a little concerned about, you know, we put all this effort in and everything to have some, uh, something change there and then you know, drop it because they, it's, a, it's a political issue opposed to being a practical issue and what's good. You know, there's this idea that somehow you can say uh, either or choice and what's good for you know business and community uh, it's also good uh, at, and also good for the environment they, they don't have to be at opposing odds to each other they they can be they can be complementary yeah that's, that's exactly right so sean would it be fair to say that success to you is is following the climate action the climate action task force recommendations continuing on the path is i would say so and achieving, I mean, achieving these goals. Yeah. Marcia? Yeah. Well, first of all, I would, I would like to say that this was a really well structured um, presentation. And I'm feeling more optimistic, which you know is not my normal. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'd like to point out that. It's really clear from the way these line up that this is a cross-cutting effort. That it touches it touches everything we do, and as long as we you know adhere to that, I think that that minimizes the effort, Harold, for all of the different pieces, because because these things, if if it just becomes a matter of the course, if it's pulled down into the core, as is clearly being done here. Um, then, then that helps us in terms of, of uh, operational effort. It does. There are some pieces in here where that still shows itself. Um, you know, as I was looking at this in terms of building good changes, you know, that's been operationally in the core where I have to get involved in terms of capacity because we have eight building inspectors that have to manage a full code that have to be part of the process because they're the ones that have to interact with the public. And, and so we can hear us say, the more we can align it with this, when we do a full code, it's easier. That's me to what we talked about yesterday because they still have to process what's coming in and have their core work that they have to do. And so that's where you're seeing the management coming in to what they're doing as we're looking at the system to the core of these buildings. So there still are pinch points in this that will show up based on what other folks are working on. This is a question of what before somebody else gets the floor that I've asked before, um, and maybe this has changed because because of the constraints that other municipalities are under financially. Are there any, is there any more availability of consultants to uh, rectify the different code changes that we need? Um, because you know we're touching land use, we're touching we're touching uh, electricity and building codes, and and uh, there's I was work preparing for the 
lightning round, and there are so many places where the codes are intertwined that boy, it would be great if, if we could get some help on that. Um, there are some. It doesn't necessarily limit me. This is another example like public private partnerships. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily. It may save us a little time, but not a lot of time. It's still an ad because you still need the right staff to manage it. And so it depends on how you approach it. Um, what I found with consultants, it's not as simple as you bring them in because they don't know the nuances of that we have to deal with. And if you let them go to on their own, we always end up finding you have to back up. And so I think that's an piece that it doesn't necessarily relieve it, it may relieve it a little bit. I will tell you in some cases it's added work. I mean, we've brought different consultants in because of what we've had to do. So it's a, it's a piece of the puzzle that we're constantly working on and how we approach it. But I think we do utilize consultants in this. I do understand the code piece. That's part of why we participated in the DOLA code cohort process because that was <coughs> grant funded to bring consultants in to develop essentially model codes for the whole county that we were part of, including folks from um, uh, building, building inspection in Blossom and, and Matt from that, from that team have been part of that process to, to bring the nuances of our community into that conversation. But then once those recommendations are finalized, we will go through our regular process to, to make sure that the final outcomes are aligned with the needs of the community. So that was essentially a, a consultant that's been helping develop those. Great, thank you. And of course, when we talk about that lightning round, you can always toss that on the list too. It's a brainstorm, right? And so there's no reason why you could just add that as part of the brainstorming conversation too. Well, I think Shani just pointed something out that we also have to watch is, we think we're the only one on the 21 code. So if the cohort is on the 18, codes, 15 or 18 codes, we're farther ahead. So what we also then have to watch is what are they putting in that may already be in the code because we're a step ahead of the other communities. That's been a concern of mine because the DOLA recommendations are so um, when there were there were two phases to that, so one of which was a requirement to get all the participating communities on the 2021 code because a lot of them aren't and have certain strengthening amendments. And then the second was a, a, a path to net zero by 2030, net zero new construction by 2030. And that's the next round of recommendations that will be coming out that look specifically at um, some additional solar elements as well as the building electrification and then some auxiliary components as well. So, so aren't we seeing that the new construction we're coming in now, maybe not net zero because you know, because windows and insulation and stuff like that. But there are already coming in all electric. So I haven't um, seen the new, I don't think the newest codes are out yet for 2024. So I don't No, no, I'm, I'm not asking what the codes are. I'm asking what the the development. The what are the developers there are, there are projects coming in that, uh, Daryl and I met with one that is all electric, utilizing solar. Um, and so we are seeing folks come into the system, even though the code doesn't require it, they're coming in with that. Um, as you look at other companies, some of those companies are making it part of their, this is just how we do business. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing that change. Yeah, so I'd like to just, just get it out there that at least some of these like building gas lines could be much earlier than the code, in the code than the global recommends for the whole region. Here. So I agree with the climate action recommendations. Um, I will, and I understand staffing um, challenges, but the education and outreach is very, 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 very important. Because when I came, when I got on council, Susan broke it down for me, and we had a meeting, and there was so much that I learned. Just although we had a one on one and she spent time with me, but um, I learned much more about why it's so important. You know, because as a single mom, you work in two jobs, you're not, you know, you, you worry about life and paying bills and taking care of your kids and your family. And so the big picture, right? 
that's so important for our community to understand. And then I think that they will buy into it and follow the instructions and the recommendations that we are asking them. So I, I, I do understand the challenges, but that is really, really key in order for the community to buy into all that we're asking, all that we know that this, we believe that this, all of this is better for the, the future of our city. But not everyone will understand that because what's going to happen when all this is implemented, we're going to have so many people come to council and say they didn't know this was happening. And so that's why education is so important in our community. So I definitely agree with all the recommendations. Great presentation also on Tuesday. I just really, really emphasize the education and outreach. So Mr. Kitty, would it be fair to say that success looks like all in Longmont understand what's at stake, what they can do, and what resources are available? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I agree. What else does success look like for the council and the city? So I also agree with your climate action recommendations and thank you for this presentation. It, it really spelled it out for us much more than I understood that was going on at the moment. Um, as far as the education and outreach, I agree with Shakita. Um, and I'm wondering if you would consider reaching out to Eddie Gutierrez, who is going to do a PRPA uh, presentation as well. Uh, he said sometime in late summer. And maybe we can do the big picture with PRPA, and then how does it affect us locally? What can we do locally? Where are we going? How does it marry into each other? So that. And is that a presentation he's giving to council? <coughs> no, it's going to be community. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Mayor, I'm adding into the to what success that she keeps said include PRPA. Correct. The other thing on the land use and water, I am also in favor of extending agricultural so, um, And then monitoring over time when you go down that downtown Cape parking, if you could, as you get into that, Lisa, um, make sure that we, that the residents know that there's alternative transportation before we do that. So if we could not go to Cape parking before we have local alternative transportation because you can't say you can't park here in Lynch Bay, but there's no other way to get downtown. So I think if we could work together, it would sell better. I think it's a really monitor section. So, Marcia, I want to make sure I caught, because I think maybe this is an okay way to place to put what you're talking about. Consider contracted services to rectify, is not the right word, to... Uh, well, rectify is, is, I guess, too technical a word. But to make all the effective codes consistent. So yeah, they, they rectify is the right, right word, but it might not be understood. So this might be a case where using more words is good. Um, I wanted to ask, because I think I'm in favor of extending agricultural <coughs> zoning, but I also remember that on the Climate Action Task Force, there were big discussions about what that means. It does not necessarily mean find more open space. Mm -hmm. um, so, can you explain what that really means? Yeah, my recollection of that one, and, and I'm going to apologize that I don't have all of these as committed to memory as I did a year or two ago, uh, but was looking specifically at making sure our zoning codes allowed for small-scale agriculture production and one of the reasons why there was a lot of conversation this got put in the midterm is because um, a lot of our planning folks felt like we did already have a lot of that in place and so we just needed to do um, some additional research to understand the intent of it to make sure that we have everything in place already and to see if there was anything additional that we needed because there currently aren't any zoning regulations that say you can't do backyard agriculture there are certain things in place around <clears throat> Um, even having, you know, beehives and chickens and all that kind of stuff. So just revisiting to make sure we understand what we're talking about. And I think in this, words really matter when we say ag zone because if it's what you can do in your backyard, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. If you grow out and look at ag, ag zoning holistically for the community, you're now putting two of your items straight up against each other, which is housing versus this. Mm -hmm. And that, that was why I asked, like, 
those are more open space. But there's there's still a third fork in that, and it it I I hope the state legislature helps us with this on HOAs because where to be up here? Um, oh, here, here. Joey's here. Yeah, yeah. David. 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 Right, 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 right. Okay, I keep forgetting that. Electricity, you know, but um, but awesome. all this all this great work has been done on um, using native grasses as turf <coughs> and all that stuff, and um, and that's also kind of under that umbrella, and it increases our sustainability without making it's it's another way to make other people do work. Well, I think your HOA piece is right because you can do it, but you still have your HOA deed restrictions that you have to adhere to. And if you're saying you have to have this type of whatever, that's what you have to do. Yeah, and there's something in the legislature about that now, but we're not sure what's going to happen. So, any other success pieces? Joe? The other thing I would add. I like your the, what you how you summarized what you do. It makes sense. When the first time uh, early in my experience at council uh, is when Lisa you brought uh, what you were or you were a group or you were headed of the board, um, and I know I was I got labeled as a data guy or you know the metrics guy very early in my tenure at council, which is okay with me. Um, but I do remember hearing the first time we saw this, and as much as I appreciate metrics, it's possible to get a wash in the sea of data without meaning. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little concerned, as you talked about the variety of, you know, just the fire hose of information and options, you're having a hard time making sense of it. Add to that these metrics, and my question is, um, some of these, there may be some dependencies in this, mm -hmm. To get to one metric, you got to get four right, or right, roll it up, figure out how to, not to simplify, but to get to the far side of the complexity with meaning to the public. That's my concern. I'm not certain, and I've been in, I've listened to this, I've been in this conversation. If I have a hard time answering the question, given the data, what are the most important results or indicators in terms of what really matters? If I can't answer that, how in the hell? Can anybody in the community answer? And that's that's my concern. Um, so I don't I don't have an answer to how we would measure success except to get to a more robust uh, indicators that re, that the community would resonate with that really matter. If we can get this one right, and why it matters to us in terms of economics, in terms of generations, in terms of you know the future of a community, you know, however we can describe it, that's my biggest concern. It's the so what. It is the so what. Exactly. It's at some, at a level, in a, in in within a context that matters to people and they can understand this. And I think that ties to what Shakita was saying is the, the outreach. Mm -hmm. And so maybe part of the vision is what Sandy has, but um, to communicate with our residents. Um, through easily understandable. Yeah, that, that's the part. part that what, the, what I wouldn't want to miss, the, the, the education is the means. Right. right. But the end is understanding. Mm -hmm. right? and, and you can have a great means, but if we're, if there is so much data, and it's a level that people can't, it just can't stick. It's got to be sticky enough for people to walk away with. And I don't know that. Not that it's not great work. I know I'm not being critical of the work. I, I think it's a great presentation and I love the work that's being done. But it's gotta be sticky enough for people to say, yeah, we gotta get this right. Yeah, we're in this together. It matters to us. So how do you take the details and elevate it into some broad core pieces yeah. that are understandable for everyone? So and relatable too, yeah. because you know, if it doesn't impact your day to day, you don't have buy-in to right. see it through. Yeah, which is why I would like the, um, the same, the same community outreach, if possible, to be done with PRPA because I, I don't want it to sound like PRPA is going to change our city. 
it is going to be us that are going to change our city. So maybe you can break it down into bites instead of the, a big picture. Just well, I think I've made steps. Than, a couple of things that I'm adding, and then I want to remind everyone about the the um, project that Lisa and I are working on around sustainability communications. So I added to Shakita's statement: easily understandable, relatable, and accessible. Right? The information needs to be able to be retained, um, and I think that's why we we decided to contract with the Moto Communications, which most of you filled out that survey. Thank you very much. That always helps support to you around sustainability. Uh, and they will help us to craft that sustainability communications plan that they have absolutely identified that bite size, relatable, actionable, accessible are the pieces that they need. So in place, I'm saying in progress, not in place, in progress. In progress. <laughs> I think there's one really essential piece that was not explicitly mentioned in this, and it's about metrics and it's also about understanding the day to day. Um, because much of this gives us gives us more control over our rates, right? If we have distributed energy resources that are controllable, I was thrilled that there's already six megawatts of solar in Longmont. I, I don't know where it's hiding, I guess, places I never go. But, um, but ultimately, when you say, yeah, if, if we can manage, if, if we can keep from um, from using electricity, using as much electricity at times when it's expensive from PRPA, um, then we're not going to be paying as much. And if we can get that piece across to the public that's supporting this work and buying into these plans and letting us help you make a plan to replace your gas furnace with something else before it breaks, um, you know, then everybody's going to understand that, that that's going to hit them in the pocketbook in a positive way. And, and so I think that, that metric definitely needs to be right at the top in the, in the outreach. And it, you know, it may be years, maybe years before we can have an impact but hey, that's like you know the, the only one more rate update cycle. And I would argue that hitting in the pocketbook is the thing that immediately makes it relatable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Well, I think I think that's the piece of what Sean said that what I've seen historically in different communities, and it kind of takes you back to the core conversation we had yesterday. There is an elasticity in a community in terms of what people are willing to pay and what they want to pay. And what you find in that elasticity is it will snap back on you and <coughs> cause you to reset everything you've done. There's communities very close to us that are going through that right now. Um, if you read the story of Westminster and the water system and what they needed to do, they saw the elasticity in it and it popped back and it completely is shifting what they can do. And I think in all of these conversations, we've got to think about that. Because what I'm talking to my folks about is we're there. I mean, when you see minimum wage rates, when you see inflation hitting, people are starting to hit that. And that's the equity lens that we start sliding on is to understand what that means. And I think as you're thinking of this, just keep that in mind on everything. Because I've seen it happen in hundreds of communities around the nation where it will snap back on you. And then you're starting over with something completely different. So um, just to add to that, I think in the education piece, as we see more and more families who can afford to put solar on, that our, our population needs to understand that in order for us all to benefit, we don't all need to have solar. That through PRPA um, and the way they, they buy uh, energy, we can all take advantage of having the benefit of renewable energy, but not every single home in the city needs to have solar on it. Um, and I think that that will ease the disparity between the lower socioeconomic part of our population 
population and that they feel like they're not being, that, that message has got to get out that because I don't have solar, then I'm not going to be able to have renewable energy. That's not true. So I don't know how to message that, but I think it's, it's a real important part. You know, it's part of the rate, um, the uh, retail rate structure that we can make sure that it, that it does, uh, and, and we can have the message out there that the guy on the next block solar is lowering your cost. Um, and, and that's something that really doesn't get out there, but, um, but it can, you know, because the less electricity we buy from PRPA at times when it costs a lot, means the less we have to raise our rates. But I do think we need to be careful about how we message that. Yes. Because um, if I'm the guy with the solar and you out there telling that um, somebody need to pay me the difference, I'm just saying, so we need to, we need to yes. get out and yes. message that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, as our, as, as our uh, nation and the different utility companies that PRPA buys energy from, <coughs> they get more renewable energy. That will come back to our city because they will be using more renewable energy as more utility companies put in renewables. So. It's a game, that's for sure. But um, to Marsha's point though, more people buying, putting solar on before PRPA gets that energy, correct me if I'm wrong, Dave. Um, it could raise the rates of people who don't have solar because they still have to purchase it. They still have to get the dollars to purchase that. That's gonna come from our rates. So the people who don't have solar before PRPA is ready, their rates are, may go up. I, I don't know, but that's just my theory. What do you think, David, is that? Does that make sense? You know, I think part of this is we're sort of trying to think into the future right. and the different individual impact. And so we have different points around that same question. Right. I think what would be helpful is where at some point here later this year we probably have a, some <coughs> of the session, something similar with council to really dive deeper into yep. the you know present value, maybe future value of solar because also to Marshall's point, if it's producing at a time that other resources are low or renewable, then it has a higher value and likewise if it's overproducing. You know, that's lower value. So it's definitely very built in. But we should explore that further. But I think saying that now might be a mistake because we kept back on yeah. we, yes, we have to we have to be very well, right? We need to yeah. work with that because really we can't kind of Well Susan mentioned the value of solar mm -hmm. exercise that we're going through, right? And that speaks exactly what Dave was talking about. How much is the solar worth to the utility and to the yes. customers who don't have the solar on our roof? One of the challenges we run into is we're kind of down at the state level in terms of what you have to reimburse the customers, uh, what rate you have to reimburse them. Mm -hmm. um, so it's possible that at certain times of the day we are overpaying for solar that's being generated because we can get it a lot cheaper from you know, a very large utility field. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You said it better. So, uh, but then at, at other times, like Councilman um, Lamarck said, you know, maybe they're that. That field is covered by a cloud, and this particular homeowner is in the middle of a sunny spot. So it's really, it's really about that. Uh, right. Figure out what that value is. Right. And Shakita, the, the um, person who pays to install the solar, put it on their roof, and uses that electricity to turn on the first, is always getting paid back first. Then the fact that they are putting electricity back onto the grid. Um, affects the city's demand favorably and that in turn affects other people's demand charges so i just know that they need to be very careful yes about the but, right because yeah. the exactly. perception of other people in the one for you paying for somebody else exactly that's all but thanks for pointing out we're all in the learning curve yeah we are
we don't we don't have this down pat yet. So so it is quarter till noon. We did have one other topic we were going to chat about before lunch, but it's up to you all. I, I think you're hopping right along with your agenda, so it's up to you whether you'd like to either spend a few more minutes on this or move to the street naming process. What we thought we would do when we got to that discussion is invite Carmen Palazzo um, Camaros to come up and talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing with the Rose and Kind of give you a sense of where we are today with respect to equity work. I don't anticipate that it would take a lot more than 15 minutes, but of course that's completely up to you all. <laughs> so are we shifting the Envision Long Launch yeah. presentation down? I thought so, yes. Okay. I, was, I was just thinking that may take a little bit. Yeah, yeah. maybe it doesn't do the same size. Um, so it's up to you. We have both of those pieces still to okay. discuss. So it's, thank you, Susie, for reminding me of that. So we can do either, either one, because actually that says 15 minutes also. And this is the question that she gave brought up around does, if we have higher density, does it increase crime? And what we did was some research to share with council to kind of help you answer that question. So you could go either direction, or no direction, and take a break. <laughs> I don't know if the folks are out there anymore. <laughs> the folks are out there for the fire trucks. For the fire trucks. So, so we could work with them, it's been done the time. We could stop early and you know, get away a fire truck and have lunch and then start back <laughs> being early. Let's do that. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna give you option one. End early, let's go give away a fire truck and have some lunch, or option two, continue on. Thumbs up. One, one. number one. One, <laughs> one, one, one. Thumbs up. Oh, yes. You're good. Okay. All right. So, but let's take a break. If you can just take five minutes and we'll meet in the front of. We're going to move into. <coughs> about density and crime. And what does that look like? If we increase density, does it increase crime? So we asked Glenn and Zach to take a look at this issue and they'd like to present a couple things for your information that you requested you to Okay, thank you. Well, thank you. Um, it's a great question. And um, often we hear that question in public hearings, but also, I think people tend to hold that one back because uh, it's a bit of a loaded question and they talk about traffic. So um, we have been talking about Envision Long Month today and yesterday. And one of the main goals is taking advantage of those empty holes that we have in the community to get uh, some different um, housing opportunities. So. Um, Two of the major goals that we always cite in our staff reports if we're having a public hearing with Planning Commission or the City Council are probably these two and they fall under the category of creating livable centers. And the first one talks about the importance of a diversity in housing types in the community. Um, and the second one really talks about high density housing and where that should occur. And um, the Envision Longmont talks about different cores, corridors, um, areas of change where there's opportunities to create additional density and ad uh, additional housing types. Um, it specifically says that it should be in areas of the downtown and the um, mixed use employment area. And I think that's where we've seen some big changes as far as the type of residential development um, we're getting. So um, I'm gonna go through some of the numbers that we've seen since we've adopted Envision, since we've adopted the zoning code to implement Envision, um, kind of show you what the trends are. And I'll leave the tough part to uh, Zach um, <laughs> to talk about, is there any relationship between crime and higher density? And, and just as a stealer of his win, I would say no. Um, because I've done this a long time and I've never really found a connection between crime um, and density. There's a million variables, but he's much more of a social scientist than I am, so I'll let him get into those glory details. Um, so that's Envision Long Month, talks about additional density. Um, if you go to the next slide, number three of 47 slides. <laughs> so I talked about areas of change. <laughs> no, there's four slides, so <laughs> let's go four. 
<laughs> Joni usually sets zero slides, so she has really let me uh, expand here. Uh, so an important part of Envision Longmont is here's where we're going to have areas of change. It's these areas that are red, and which really identify some of those corridors and where we have mixed-use employment, uh, maybe uh, employment uses that are down on their luck, and, and there's opportunities to bring new housing in there. Um, it's always great to have jobs close to housing, um, so it really fits that bill. And then, of course, Main Street is also a, an important corridor, and we've recently amended the Main Street corridor and the comp plan to make um, higher densities and different types of housing much more possible. And then there's the areas of stability, which are primarily our existing neighborhoods. Um, yellow is kind of a, a typical land use color for single family, but in this case, it doesn't mean these are all single family neighborhoods. Um, Envision Longmont sees some change, but the level of change in the areas of stability are quite a bit reduced compared to where we're focusing in areas of change. So I thought what I would do, because we are seeing a lot of multifamily, and it makes a, it makes a big input uh, impact on our citizens when they see a vacant lot turn into 200 units that's four stories high. It's, I, I understand, it, it makes kind of a shock to the system. So I thought I'd take a look at what our permit activity is, because once you go through adopting the plan, adopting a new zoning code, then we have to build uh, to the new code and people have to put up the money to actually get it done. So here's uh, kind of the trend. So single family is the blue at the top and everybody knows what that is. That's pretty clear. That's one house for a, a lot surrounded by space. It's not touching anything else. And then um, we have uh, what I'm just calling attached housing. So this could really be anything from a duplex, triplex, um, uh, multifamily, high density apartments, or anything in between. Um, we could go through and kind of figure out what all those layers are, but this is where you're probably, your affordable and your attainable housing is happening within that realm. Yes, I'm counsel. trying to get my bearing right there. Is that north of 66? Yes. Like yeah, that's... <laughs> okay. And then so the area of change, so like right here, are those, there are houses currently there, correct? Or is that Not kind many. Of bigger, is it, or is it open space? It's yeah, open right space. Here well, over, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's the Terry Lake neighborhood. So there currently um, aren't homes there. That's Right now, pretty wide open. There's a Lutheran church along that corridor. Okay, the light yeah, bridge yeah. is not in red, but it's a, right before you get to Main Street. Okay, so right over here. Yes. Okay. And then the other step would be the vacant property okay. kind of north of Walmart in front of the top of yeah. the apartments, mm -hmm. and then that yeah, farm so right across here. the street that yes. also I think you guys saw last year for a annexation referral. Yes. And you asked for more density. So those are what's up that So happen. is this whole section then? Um, something that we are looking to annex, or it is annexed. It, it is, is already, red. or yeah, that's, or is it already annexed? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I want to jump in. I, I think um, we've actually gotten into this internally, exactly part of this, where someone said, "Is it open space?" And I go, "Capital <laughs> O." Yes. 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 Uh, yes. Yeah, that's, and that's a big piece. Yeah. And that yeah. is that is not well, It's not even little, that's not open space. That is undeveloped land that is okay. owned by somebody else. Okay. And there is a, we, we've got to be really careful as we're making those distinctions because a lot of times what we see in development projects is that people go, well, it's open space. It's really undeveloped land that's owned by another party. They just yes. haven't built anything okay. on it. And I think we see that a lot. Okay, and that's what I wanted to, I didn't mean, yeah, annex was an incorrect word because I was thinking of the open space or developable area. Yeah, in fact, I think you'll, um, I think there's some apartments coming out, we call it Notch 66, that is just east of Walmart in that corridor, it's part of that red area. Um, a lot of apartments are happening around the sugar mill, you've talked about that a little bit, um, around Sandstone Ranch seen a lot of density um, going in there. 
So as far as the numbers, um, there's a lot of uh, levels to the multifamily attached. Um, so I can't tell you that's all apartments. Um, I will say that the change in permitting over the last four years has changed quite a bit. We were primarily dominated by single family. Now um, I'd say, um, let's see, it was uh, 2019 where about 60% of the permits were some kind of attached housing. Um, 2020, that turned to, I think, 80%. Um, and it was about the same in 2021. 2022, um, uh, as far as what we permitted out of development services, 90% was some kind of attached product. Um, but what I wanted to show, first off, the, um, the uh, uh, vertical lines here is when we adopted the comp plan in, um, I think it was June of uh, uh, 2016. Um, that doesn't really change things much because it's not the law. Then we went into a two-year process and adopted the new land development code, which happened in towards the end of 2018. And that's when there are oh, we opened up areas as far as where higher density housing could occur. But really, it didn't have a big change, um, at least in the last uh, six years, between the percentages of types of units. We're in uh, 2016, we're still two thirds single family. And we added about a third of some kind of attached process. Um, fast forward uh, six years, um, you know, it changed about 4% basically. So it's not a great escalation in density. And maybe I was thinking that that might be a relief, but maybe we're not doing our job well enough uh, uh, when we look at the goals of the uh, comp plan. But if you, uh, uh, Excel just kind of drew the trend line here. There's really not a whole lot of magic to it. But it, even if you took the single family line and you flattened it out at that 25,000, and then you increase the multifamily at the rate it's going now, we, we still are looking at 20 years where we're still gonna be a single family community um, before we hit parity between attached units and single family. So it's it's not something that is happening overnight, um, but we are, I think, moving the ball forward as far as the goals of Envision Longmont. Um, now the tough questions, and I think uh, Zach's got a good idea as far as the trends and some of the programs um, that's kind of geared towards multifamily. Thank you, Glenn. Before I started, were there any questions that you wanted to ask about Glenn's slide or anything before I move forward? All right. <laughs> You said it would take about 20 years to hit parity. You, you say that dependent on the land development code, correct? Mm -hmm. If the land development code was altered or something more radical happened, right. you could see a difference in the trends. Yeah, that's the rules that are set today, basically, and the economic environment that we have today. Right? So a lot of things can affect those and stretch it out longer than that. And I want to clarify something as well. So we have <coughs> residents that are talking about Envision Longmont, but it is not Envision Longmont from the point, the part that you showed us for uh, high densities. According to Envision Longmont, it would be um, not in residential areas. Right. It would be, the, and it was the LDC that actually changed that. Is right. That correct? Okay. Yes. Right. So the, the policy is basically let's put higher density in those underutilized sites, a lot of them being in mixed use employment um, areas. And I'd say that's the higher percentage of where we're actually seeing projects land. Okay. Yeah. Now there is some change. Um, in fact, uh, I talked to a gentleman who was here, he, he left a statement for uh, public to be heard, but um, he's concerned with the term areas of stability. So that we need change there. And we have a mixed use neighborhood that did allow an incremental change in the land uses under very specific conditions that can occur in those areas of change. Um, there is some additional density, not to the point of, um, you know, like in a mixed use employment area. And there is some retail if it's in a specific location that is allowed um, in those areas of stability. So the code is not just a mixed-use employment area where you can have density, but it also 
is for mixed use residential areas as well for infill. Is that correct? Right? Yes. Okay. And we also have mixed use downtown that um, actually in those districts, there's no cap on density. But in mixed use neighborhood, there is. It can only, densities can only be from six to 18 units per acre is, is like a cap, um, which would be the yellow areas. So. And the density also uh, applies to vertical. Yeah, absolutely. So it's four with fifth floor being uh, we allow four stories in the mixed use districts with an ability to perform to go up above with affordable housing um, next to transit and there's a third oh mixed use so if you bring in retail on your ground floor you can potentially put additional story on that's not in the mixed use neighborhood though that is specifically in mixed use downtown mixed use employment there's a third, I can't, oh, uh, corridor, mixed use corridor, which is Main Street, basically. Well, it's interesting. So, talk to real time learning on this. But we're, we're learning through on the housing side and the affordable mixed housing street. side in particular is that the addition of one floor actually is a problem because under affordable housing, when we bring federal funds into it, mm -hmm. uh, then a fifth floor changes its commercial. And when it changes its commercial, it goes into commercial Davis Bacon, which all of a sudden drastically changes the, the cost parameters of it. So as Molly and I were getting into these projects, we throw that out now that we're on the other side building, it's like you can't use it because it shifts the economics of the entire project. So from the affordable piece, when you say, if you do this, then this, what we're realizing is it doesn't work because you can't use it based on the outside constraints that are coming in when you use those funds. So we're also learning real time about what we have in that works and doesn't work and what's viable, and it's really the economics that are driving those decisions for us. And rules that we can't control. You know, that's controlled by the feds. The default type of vertically would be a code change. Correct. Um, yeah. No. No? No, you could potentially, in those mixed use, four mixed use districts, um, they, you could go seven stories, but you have to perform to go above four. Just like Carol's talking about, if you're doing, you're, you're building affordable housing within your project, you potentially could go up a story. If you <laughs> yeah, but I, there are uh, there, there's issues with that, and I thought Harold was going to say elevators because generally you go to four stories, you're putting in at least two elevators typically for ADA accessibility, and that that adds some price. Well, in the four you can't have two elevators anyway under under the ADA the facts of that. Yes. UFAP standard. So that's now where, where it could make sense is if you're in a if you're building the affordable into a market rate project and, and you're not connected to the federal funds, then that could be a, a viable solution for you. But if you're bringing it into a live tech project like we're using, like we do, then it doesn't work. All the nuances you're starting to see them. Um, about doesn't work. So the extra story, I, I, I picked this up in a conversation with you some time ago. Um, Florida's a bad place, or the fifth is a bad place. Correct. Does it start working in the end when you go to seven? If the economics change. You know, that's what you have to understand is that's where the pro forma will start telling you what will work and what won't work based on the financial requirements that the lending, that the investors equity investors and the lending institutions. And so the pro forma will really guide that piece. We think that it may shift it, but we haven't done that calculation yet. So this is something that we need to learn. Carol, if we go from four to five, of course, it doesn't construction type change. Aren't you then talking about pedestal? You're talking pedestal and I know almost nothing about what I'm saying. Yeah. What I've learned from developers that 
at five stories, it's pedestal. If you're going to, you do need elevators. It's more expensive construction. Is that is that true? That's generally true. And a good example is look at Ninth and Main Street. Yeah, they have concrete and steel first floor, and then they're going wood frame above it, and that's typically what you would see. Four stories. Yes, you can. I think it depends on how you're designing the project. Uh, and so for us, elevators and what we're building for affordable, that's that's just a given. And so we're, we're managing that within the pro forma, whether it's four or five. Or, uh, and so I think it's it gets really project specific and it's hard to say. But that's what we're learning for as we're doing this sort of housing. All right, I know I've got to, about to get the hook from Sandy, but I want to make sure there's enough time. So Councilman Yarbrough brought up a great question uh, a few months ago uh, in, in preparation and wanting us to bring this back about, does density and crime have a uh, correlation that they relate to each other? And what I want to, I guess, suggest to, to Council is when I take a look at our community, I have to look at public safety as a whole. Meaning, how does that pertain both to law enforcement and how does that particularly pertain to fire uh, services that we provide. And so one of the things I want to touch on, I'm actually going to talk about just for a few minutes, the fire side of things, because I think a lot of times we forget that piece. But what I will tell you that anytime you increase the population or anytime your population grows, there is an increased need for public safety. So when we talk about that, whether we are responding to medical calls, which we did over 7,000 last year, whether it is responding to a domestic within a, a home or a residence, Again, those things happen when you bring folks in. Neighbors don't agree, barking dogs, things that we typically get called with of quality of life issues that may not necessarily be crime related. And so when we talk about those things, I think it's important not only to remember the police, but also look at the fire side of things. Because with increased people, again, if you build a high density um, multi location and it's all senior citizens, then we know that that particular area is gonna have an increase in medical calls more than likely than we would see in other areas. And so again, it's those types of things that we have to consider. As the city is transitioning or, or thinking of transitioning from more of a subdivision style, single family home to high density, multifamily, we also have to begin to think about how are we going to protect the properties. So whether we're talking about UE, wildland, urban um, initiative, and how some of those things apply, if we're going to make roads smaller so that we can use more land space, then we have to think about how are we going to get emergency equipment down the roads? If there's on-street parking, how are we going to get the necessary things in there? And I will tell you that Glenn and his staff have, have worked with us and Michelle Goldman, if you are familiar with her, she's our fire marshal and her staff, review every plan. And so there was conversations and have been continued conversations between us and Glenn and Joni and her staff talking about as we begin to transition as a city, to look at more opportunities to fill in and go up, what does that look like for first responders and how does that public safety respond to those things? Whether it's looking at changing the types of fencing based on uh, the study from the Marshall Fire that I think will come out very soon. Are we looking at changing the requirements of the fencing so it's not wood and it doesn't spread the fire quickly? Do we need to go to other some type of fire retardant fencing to try to save homes? What do we need to do? And so we begin to look at that. Again, the space in between the buildings, what type of materials are we using? Because again, in the South, if you did, you know, uh, multifamily housing or you did townhomes together, they're typically vinyl siding, right? We don't see that here. But again, one fire starts and it moves very quickly. So again, making sure we're using the right material. So it's a very, it's a very big conversation. And when you start talking about crime and you start talking about, well, if we build apartments, is it going to bring a bunch of crime? It's very hard to give you an exact answer because it depends on a lot of social economical issues related to an individual that may be living in a wide variety, whether it's a single family home or it's a, an apartment. And so for an example, we may have, I hold eight properties um, that we would classify as multifamily and look at. And so you may see one area have more calls for service, but they're not generating very many reports, right? It may very well simply be because the neighbor next door is playing their music too loud. So we knock on the door, we're like, hey, you might turn it down, thank you very much. It's not always crime-based every time we show up to a location. It is some, sometimes what we would classify as a simply a quality of life issue. Maybe it's a parking issue in the parking. Um, somebody's in their spot, right? Maybe it's because somebody's over the line. You know, they're taking up two spots. 
So a lot of the calls that we get, but I want to put it in perspective because when we begin to look at some of our commercial properties, they have just as high call volume than some of our apartment complexes combined. And so I won't throw any retailers under the bus, but you could probably figure that out. And so again, when you look at it, it depends on, there's driving factors for each thing. So we, we have some, some multifamily housing gets more calls than less, but we also have some houses and subdivisions get a lot more calls than everybody else. And so again, it's, it's a balance of those things. Now, what we are doing and we have been doing for quite some time, um, next slide, there we go. So we have been doing crime-free multi-housing. What this is and, and what this has been, this is an initiative that we work with, again, um, multiple or multi-housing um, residents. So whether it's apartment, condos, whatever it is, we work with the management. Uh, this is something done through Dave Kennedy and Sarah and Arnie, who are our neighborhood resource officers. And so they work with management. I think we hold a class once a quarter and there's usually 30 or 40 folks in there. And what this does is create that piece between public safety and between management to let them know what's going on in their building, what the challenges that we're having, what we're doing, here it is. We don't force them to do anything, but it gets them to let them know, hey, here's a problem in your area, here's what we're seeing, here's what we're dealing with, here's what we do. So those reports and those conversations are happening on a weekly basis, if not on a daily basis. Now what we also- Exactly, why don't you just type for one quick second on oh. the Oh, okay. Bye. 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 Thank you. Sorry. 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 Totally threw me off now. I know. Thanks. I, know. I was on a roll. Um, Sorry. So, so what, it, what it does is it allows management and public safety to work together. Now, if management decides to do something that's great. If they don't, that's fine too. But it lets them know, right? And again, a lot of it is quality of life issues, not necessarily crimes. And so again, having those conversations. Now, one of the other pieces that, that Longmont has kind of been very on the forefront, and I know Glenn and Sarah Arnie and Dave Kennedy have been having conversations, is as we begin to build more density, more multifamily locations, to make sure we use what's called crime prevention through environmental design, also known as SEPTED standards. What this does is, is, is essence is use the environment. And I made some examples. So again, the apartment complex, you know what you're required to put a dental or a townhome on each arm. Uh, alarms, make sure they all have alarms. Make sure that there's fencing. Make sure there's lighting. Again, make sure there's lighting in open spaces at dark time, right? It doesn't invite folks to hang out or linger in the shadows. Again, it, it, light makes people run away for some reason. So that has been a piece that we have talked about with Glenn and Joni and their staff about how do we get more of this into the code so that as, as council and as planning and zoning and folks begin to make decisions on the direction of our community, how do we use some of the best practices that are out there nationwide in SEPTED that allow us to try to create a safe environment for the individuals? So I know that's a lot, and I could probably talk for about 45 more minutes on what we've got, but what I want to, I guess really what I hope that you take away is understanding that anytime you increase population, there, there's gonna be additional apartments of public safety. Traffic accidents, traffic, people living together. There's just a, a wide variety of things, medical calls, whatnot. But there are programs and there are things that we are doing and have been doing for quite some time to build the relationships with um, those areas and begin to build relationships. So for example, we have over 400 properties documented in Longmont that are rentals. We have over half of those are part of our um, crime-free multifamily housing. We're not required to be a part of it, but about 50% of those are already involved with us and already getting the information they need on a daily basis to manage their communities or that they have. Right, so I know there's probably a lot of questions, so I will open it up. Okay. Whoever wants to go for it, both of you raise your hand at the same time. <laughs> so is this uh, this uh, crime prevention through environmental design, is this sort of what you're doing with some of our projects in regards to like the, the place of laundry rooms and things like that? Uh, so it's a piece of it. What we're talking about on the laundry rooms is uh, trauma-informed design based on the type of individuals we're going to be housing. But we do do that, so Sarah's part of the housing authority. And, and so we are bringing the step tech component on it. So in Kristen right now, we're looking at chains and fixtures. 
because there's a dark spot. And we all know what happens in a dark spot. So that's the kind of input that we get on these projects. So yes, but it's a little bit more than on the design of the library. And, and I think the best example I can give you is speed bumps, right? We get a lot of complaints, people speeding through a neighborhood or speeding through, a, a, let's just say, a car complex or a condo complex. Speed bumps force you to slow down. It doesn't require a law enforcement interaction, but the design itself requires an individual to either tear their car up or actually slow down through that community. Or so those types of things. in the parking lot, not on the street. So when I'm talking, when I say that, I mean like the entrance to like an apartment, you guys line through the development. Yeah. Again, putting those those physical barriers uh, where it doesn't allow that vehicle to ride through there at 90 miles an hour, which is what we do. Oh, they're running, through, they're racing through here. But it, what it does is forces us. So, so through design standards, you can mediate or moderate or control some of the future complaints that you might get based on driving habits. Yes, ma'am. So this is kind of the other side of the crime-free multiple housing coin. Um, because it worries me a little bit as, as an equity issue. I understand that, uh, especially for vulnerable populations, crime-free multi-housing is necessary um, for, for the safety of the people who, who live there. And yet, yesterday, Harold News said, careful because people are losing their housing and one of the reasons they lose their housing is because they have committed crimes where do they go because the last thing we want is people who have committed crimes but are not incarcerated to be on the street so do we have a housing model that takes care of those people i think the model is really no, I think the model is built on how do you do what you can to prevent that from ever occurring. But it does. And it does because there are times you can't prevent that from occurring. And so when we look at the processes that we go through on the affordable housing side, it's exhausting. And, and so when you hit that point, you have really gone through a litany of things that where you try to work with the individuals and it's just not changing. Now, on the other side of it, there is a piece where there are immediate issues that develop that are life safety related that you have to deal with. Shooting someone in the unit, threatening other people in, in the complex, breaking into the office. I mean, the, the, those are components that you just have to deal with, but I think it goes to what Zach's saying in here's one. Um, when we look at the call volume from the properties and the housing authority, and we compare it to what it used to look like and what it looks like now, the call volumes are dramatically different in that it was not uncommon for us to see 10 to 15 calls per week at the sweeps. There are weeks we don't have any calls for service. At the sweeps. And we're, but we're seeing that uniform in all of our properties, and it is because if you don't do this, then it creates this. And I understand all of those things, but what you're not saying is that that process, which makes the properties we manage safer and have fewer calls, also excludes some people. What I'm asking about is what happens are excluded? Um, I think it depends on the person. Well, I'm telling you, I hear from the public who says <coughs> they are excluding these people when they are on the streets. And when I say Long Run helps people into housing or Long Run helps people avoid losing their housing, Long Run also helps people out of housing when they are difficult to live with and infringing on the rights of others and yeah. infringing on the rights of others but they don't lose their rights when that happens and so I, i'm just i think there's a gap i think we need to have a way to house people it's kind of hard difficult to house 
this probably leads to this is a little off topic for what these these folks are here to talk about, but it certainly seems like what we're going to be doing next once we get through these two information pieces is asking you what does success look like in each of these areas. So I would maybe hang on to that because housing is next. I just wanted to point it out at this point. Yeah, I think you can raise a good point. Does anyone have any questions for Glenn or for Zach about particularly the crime rate for density? I want to make sure you have your questions answered. Yeah, I, I appreciate you all um, answering this question for me because we have heard this several times. I know myself and have heard that question uh, about if we increase the density uh, within the city of Longmont, that is going to increase the crime rate. And I wanted you all to have the opportunity to present that, let us know if it was yes or no. And um, because we don't want to give false information, although we know that, you know, that it really didn't. And I appreciate the fact that just because the calls are being increased um, within the, the station, you know, people are hearing that, oh my gosh, you see the red lights going to the certain neighborhood. Those are that doesn't mean it was a crime. It could have just been somebody uh, playing a radio too loud and the officer coming over there. I don't know, but I appreciate you mentioning that and also the fire side. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's very important too, and that we we're dealing with the human race. We're dealing with people. So we can't control the choices that people make within their lives. All we can do is try to prevent um, what we can do in our own city and within our departments. And I appreciate the fact of having the crime prevention through environmental design. And I mean, I like the name of it too, that's pretty cool. But um, those are our measurements that apartment complexes, complexes can take. Um, people, uh, property owners can take these measurements. And like you said, we know more than half of our participate in the crime-free housing. That is key, you know? And so understanding that we have these programs um, for our community, for those who own housing, and we're not saying it's going to work perfectly fine for you. We, we're not saying that because we cannot control another human being, but we can put um, measurements in place, you know, you can put measurements in place uh, of like making sure you have dead bolts on, dead bolts on your house. Same thing. Um, so housing is needed in our, in our community. It does not cause increase of crime in our community. Um, but it doesn't, because we have more people, there may be more issues, there may be more speed, and there may be more complaints in our community. So I just want people to think outside the box a little bit and, um, and you know, contact our public safety department, contact our fire department to ask those questions to get the facts, more so than spreading um, false information. And if we need to have a, you know, another conversation about this, I would love to have another conversation with our community, but you know, Educating our community is very important when we hear the same stuff over and over again that's not true. And that's why I wanted to bring it up because I know that that you all are doing a, a, a lot of work and a very good job. So I just wanted to make sure that we put that out there. I don't know if I'm missing anything. Hey, hang on to that also as a success measure, right? So when we get into housing and I ask what the success look like, right? Educating people on what density really looks like. So what's the difference between the crime rate and numbers of crimes. <clears throat> you talk about specifically for one. Well, if we're going to, our, as our pop, what I heard you say, mm -hmm. and it just is logical, as the population grows, there'll be more calls for a variety of things. Sure. Some of it crime, some of it just nuisance kinds of things. So it wouldn't. I, I don't think should anybody should be surprised as our population grows. There's going to be more. There'll be more calls for a variety of things. That's different, that seems to me, a rate yeah. is a calculation, right? Right. It's numbers of crimes per capita, numbers of crimes per automobiles, number of crimes per housing units. It's some metric, right? Right. So that's different yes. than numbers of just the frequency of calls. Correct. Because it, 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 it's conceivable in my mind, given what we're doing, 
we can have uh, a, a growing population and a growing number of calls and a decreasing rate, uh, actual crime rate. Mm -hmm. That would be an important statistic or a metric for us to know when somebody says, you know, it's out of control. Well, you know, we're, we're, we have a population that's growing. <coughs> Who should be surprised? But you understand the actual rate is going down. And, and I, if it is, I, yeah, and we can, we can, I can certainly get that to council uh, for the 2022 numbers for what we saw. Um, but again, I think that that's, there's, there's some confusion in those numbers too, because if you look at crimes that we have here, it doesn't mean it's by everybody that lives here in the population of Longmont. So again, we can look at some of our past incidents that have occurred that's made media attention and we find out that those individuals don't live here. So again, when you start drilling into those numbers, you've got to begin specifically look at those types of incidents because it can give you a skewed sense of what it is. And so, for example, if you talk about motor vehicle theft, right? I know it's a hot topic, but we had an individual who arrested, I think it was 15 times over motor vehicle thefts. So again, it doesn't mean that 15 people in our population were doing it, it's one individual. And so, again, we can certainly get you the data of what our crime rate looked like um, and get that for you. I don't have it with me now. Certainly get that to council. But again, I think you have to dive even deeper into just a, a crime rate, you know, 32% stolen motor vehicles. You know, you've got to dive a little bit further and more into that uh, than just the number itself. So, yes, sir, good and question. That, that's a, that's a thing too that's part of SEPTIC, right? Is, is if we engineer our full community to make fewer opportunities for people to come in here and commit crimes, that's part of the design too. Correct. It is. It is correct. So I want to be real cognizant because we want to get back to making sure that we understand the goal pieces before we before we part ways today. Are you all comfortable moving on to talk a little bit about street All right. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Carbon Ramirez Community and Neighborhood Resources. Uh, thanks for allowing me to come forward on this conversation. So I want to put up uh, a few things just as background information that I think will be helpful. I uh, want to start off with um, my understanding in regards to the naming of Mount Evans has been postponed uh, due to uh, getting additional tribal consultation. And what I will say on that is that what has been so important is when it comes to renaming, uh, is consulting with the very communities that are impacted. And that those voices are the ones that are up front uh, in this. Uh, the last time that we did have a renaming, that was brought forward by community members out in the community. Um, so if you recall, Shivington is now Sunrise. Um, but that came from a community group that brought that forward. They lived on the street. They yeah. did not they live on the street. street. So, and that's an important uh, piece to know, that it came from communities who did not live on the street. It then um, elevated to the point that we had to have a community-wide conversation and then a neighbor conversation and then <coughs> assist the neighbors in understanding the importance of that name change, the why, and then assisting them with the how. So we help with paying for uh, postage to give up notice. Well, they first they pick the name because they live there, uh, and then helping them with change of addresses. Everything from postage to um, community meetings to help them understand what do you need to do with the as your street name is changing. So that technical logistical piece is what community and neighborhood resources assisted with. So we have that. We are now at this point, but I wanted to start with something else. 
So I'm going to start with our land acknowledgement. And when it, you hear this land acknowledgement, I'm, I think what the next step is to talk about actions. So, um, and this council is, is pretty much the council that uh, adopted this land acknowledgement. So, we acknowledge that Longman sits on the traditional territory of the Cheyenne, Arapaho youth, and other indigenous people. We honor the history and the living and spiritual connection that the first people have with this land. It is our commitment to face the injustices that happened when the land was taken and to educate our communities, ourselves, and our children to ensure that these injustices do not happen again. When I read this out wherever I'm at, I immediately then go to the action because we don't want this statement to be a token statement. It is a living uh, statement. And so the way that we have brought life to this and created action, uh, one started with our relationship with the Northern Arapaho. I took several years to build that relationship. Um, I never would have imagined that I would be in a sweat lodge with council members and the mayor. Uh, that, and, and especially for me, because that's a very private part of my life. And now I've got council in a sweat lodge. <laughs> um, so, but what it really hinged on was building relationships, getting to know one another, understanding the injustices that happen and where do we create so the first youth exchange that we did, uh, before we do any youth exchange for the youth and for the parents and the chaperones, we go through what is called the doctrine of discovery. So we go through an exercise that shows the students and the parents and those that are, are uh, chaperoning what that means and what that history is. But what I hear in a lot of Native communities is that we are not gone. We are not a part of history or we are here. And if you'll see in our museum, we have this exhibit. I hope everybody gets to see it. It's called Duality. And it's that mixture of contemporary and traditional. There's a piece in there regarding boarding schools. We did a lot of education with the First Council around the story of Northern Arapaho and Cheyenne and how the division had happened and how they were moved, right? We also did a lot of education around um, <clears throat> boarding schools for council and for community members. We also did a lot of education around a film called Two Rivers. And Two Rivers was a community that said, well, I moved here, but I think there might have been other people here before me. Who are they? Where are they? And how do we rebuild relationships? And re rebuilding of the relationships has been key. So when I see this, I laminated this because it has a land acknowledgement and it has a picture of the first youth that came down. All 10 of them stayed at my house because we had to understand that I could not do a traditional where you uh, send them out to a home, right? Many of the kids have never left the reservation. I'm not going to put them in a home where they don't know. Okay, so we we progress. Our youth go up there. So just as you saw with sister cities, our youth are going to Japan, to Mexico, to Northern Arapaho. But not only our youth, we have community members that have formed that. I think Dr. Waters took a ride up to Northern Arapaho, up to Wind River to meet and talk to people, to hear stories. Uh, we have a meeting next week uh, set with uh, business council members to talk about open space and what are opportunities. All of these are initial conversations because we want to be careful to uh, tend to the relationship and to be culturally appropriate and sensitive right it's it's a heavy conversation if you haven't seen we have a little documentary a little documentary <laughs> called little by little <laughs> and it tells the story more importantly that same month during native american uh month we did a series a series of films but we also brought in people from northern arapaho to have a conversation and i think dr waters recalls one of the things that my husband Neither do you want to share that? <laughs> well, Ray was sharing, <clears throat> he was in North Carolina, as I recall. Yes. And there was a panel 
that included leadership from this, a tribe there. <clears throat> and the topic of reparations came up. Yes. And um, there was an audience member, as I recall the story, who reacted to the idea of reparations, saying, you know, I'm not responsible for what my grandfather did or my father did. Right. Don't hold me accountable. And Ray's description of uh, the leader, right, of this indigenous Chief people Luke? sitting on the stage said, you know, I would never hold you accountable. If your grandfather or your father stole a horse from my family, I would hold you accountable unless you still have the horse. Uh, it's a pretty powerful statement. Mm -hmm. So I think we are looking at opportunities on a one-on-one -on -one to relationship build, to bring in and make visible communities of color. We do that in different fashions, but we're really working on that. And sometimes what happens is that that good stuff that happens isn't necessarily known by everybody. Um, but we also want to be um, mindful of investing to create that consciousness so that it is at a higher level. Um, I will tell you that to this day, we used to have an, an event called Inclusive Communities that highlighted 15 different, like about 15 different cultural groups local. We had our African American community, our Chinese, our Nepalese, our Native American community, our Sami community. Uh, believe it or not, we got a couple of folks that are Samis and we would bring them forward to this. And so I'm mentioning all this because I think it's important in your conversation to be mindful of where do we invest to raise that community consciousness? Where do we invest to continue to have challenging conversations? Longmont Multicultural Action Committee has worked on uh, last year a uh, Voices of Change um, and they brought through and they had, we had um, a Voices of Change panel on hate crimes. And we had someone from the NAACP and Out Boulder, the LBTQ community, and the DA's office, as well as one on the Latino <coughs> community and then one on the Native American community. Those continuations, um, I think, are really helpful in that raising of consciousness. But I also think that it is uh, you as leaders those steps that you want to take uh, in regards to whether it's retribution or whether it's consciousness raising, um, I will leave that in your hands to discuss. Uh, but I thought it, this information might be helpful. So, and do you have a recommendation for us on this particular request? Does it make more sense to take this as part of the relationship building with the Northern Arapaho tribe? or multicultural action committee? Is there a recommendation that you have for the council? Well, and, and I'm biased. <laughs> uh, Aren't we all? <laughs> I'm biased because I really uh, believe that the work that we're doing through Sister Cities and the work that we're doing through the Multicultural Action Committee has a potential to reach that education to, and when we talk about education, um, how to really be authentic of being telling the true story. Right? And whose story, and who gets to be the storyteller? So when we meet with Northern Arapaho about open space, we want them to be the ones telling the story. That means the good and the bad. Um, I recently had a conversation about sandstone and what story is told there on Sand Creek. It's only one version. So we're gonna work with them to tell another one. So I think it's, it's a choice. Um, do you want to take on this issue or do you want to invest in other ways where we can continually raise that consciousness and that education? Um, given that it is very hard to reach the whole community, right? Um, so, uh, but I think it also is important in that recognition of why names are changing. Uh, there's an article that, that was circulating regarding the um, the state taking a pause and, and going back. But I wanted to call out something else in that article of some name changes that happened because this is not just a Native American issue. Uh, there used to be a, a place called Negro Creek and Negro Mesas, right? Don't even know, didn't even know, right? It's been changed to um, Clay Creek and Clay Mesa. 
There are communities that still have sundown lots, right? So there is an importance piece to that as to looking back at names, places, as well as policies and laws that, that maybe uh, were, were placed there for a very specific to be derogatory, uh, to limit access, uh, those kinds of things. So I will leave that conversation as that I'm biased that the community work that we're doing in building bridges. Um, I had a young man who was here today when uh, Ciudad Guzman came. Uh, we brought in um, folks from Northern Arapaho to do a teepee raising. Uh, we had fry bread. Uh, and we also um, had a, a film on Buffalo, and it's a young man from here, uh, a young white man who came up to me and was kind of tearful and thanked us for giving him the opportunity. Because he said, I would never have had this opportunity. And then having young people, and I think Dr. Waters and Susie were in the council chambers mm -hmm. when our Longmont youth and our Northern Arapaho youth took over the council chambers. Yeah. Uh, they became council, <laughs> and I, I won't say, but they voted on um, building dorm rooms for the youth center and the swimming pool, right? Yes. So they already gave you direction on, on what their needs were. Uh, so I will tell you that um, since we started this, um, Sister Cities hired a Northern Arapaho young woman to be uh, their summer intern during uh, last summer. Um, I frequently pe have people staying at my house because <laughs> this is a, a place where they feel welcome and they feel at home. I think that piece of, um, at least Spoon Hunter said this when we did the signing for the Northern Arapaho. He said, I've heard stories of my homeland. I am, I'm not gonna say his age, but he's older. <laughs> and he said, I have never been to Estes and I've heard stories. Dr. Waters remembers, I heard stories of why we came through here, right? And to feel welcome and to feel like we can enter into a conversation, a present day conversation, not a past day conversation. But I also think it's important to uh, fix those mistakes from the past too at some point. So I know I didn't answer the question. <laughs> Fair enough. I appreciate, I appreciate your wisdom, Carmen. Thank you. So, so I want to be really cognizant of the time. We have an hour left. I know uh, Councilman Riabra has to leave at three. We have an hour left. We've got four goals that we would like to um, talk about what the success goal would look like to kind of finish out the day. Um, is there more conversation you'd like to have about? I just have comments. comments on yes. that. Thank you, Carmen. I really do appreciate that. And it, and the purpose of bringing this up is that uh, I think we should, as a community, be cognizant of uh, of uh, when uh, there are efforts to make a change, like we're seeing with Mount Evans, uh, to not be toned up to the situation uh, and. Uh, and it's not just uh, the northern Arapaho. You know, I, I think of people like my uh, my wife's sister's husband. Her, uh, his mother was uh, grew up in an internment camp, uh, not here but in uh, California. You know, we have another relationship with uh, Japan. But, you know, I'm not proposing in any stretch of the imagination going through and looking at uh, uh, changing every. Uh, things. I think it's a good thing to have this practice in place. Dr. Carmen looks like they, uh, they now look at these things, uh, uh, names of uh, streets when we do uh, uh, new development. I think there's there's room in there for maybe that group to consider looking at this as well. Uh, and I just think that uh, uh, we, we certainly don't want to, uh, uh, with the where we're talking about uh, sustainability and safety and all these other aspects not address that that point. and so uh, I think there's you know we've got a historic preservation commission we've got uh, uh, you know uh, you know uh, these other community groups that can do 
some of this work here uh, and we can feel the outcome and it wouldn't be that big of a, a challenge for them to help move this forward. But I also think that you don't have to live on the street to, uh, to feel uh, slighted, wronged, or uh, have a grievance. And so I think that it's a uh, it, it's, uh, step in the right direction. It's, it's progressive in the sense of, uh, of respecting others. And so I think it's something that we should consider uh, doing. And it's, uh, I just, uh, you know, when I hear members of the public that, that are against it, it, it really is, I, I think it's a, it's a tone deafness to the, the realities of how people really feel. And so we have to be conscious of these things. As a city, it certainly makes sense, I think, for us to follow maybe the state lead, particularly in Mount Evans, as a specific one single topic. But perhaps relying on the Longmont Multicultural Action Committee bringing this up, that this is a concern that the council has, that may be a, a better way than creating a separate task force. Absolutely. Okay. And there may be limitations to what we're, we're wrong. Maybe we're going to limit it to the various characters out there, but maybe not uh, uh, presidents uh, and things like that. I don't know how, what our parameters would be, but you know, we can talk, uh, they can talk. Amongst themselves, that looks like. Yeah, um, I, I think it's always good to hear to have conversations like this. Now. Many of us don't know about the needs of the city, but if someone has brings it up, it's worth the conversation and exploring. And if the person that brings it up wants to do, you know, because it is their issue to begin with, sorry, Michelle. Um, to do some research and help us along. Um, how does that relate to Colorado and Longmont in particular? Or does it? Or get the conversation started. It'll, it'll be a long road. And again, looking at our base level of services, I, I don't think this is something that, you know, staff should be approved on. But um, on that, um, be a good place to start to other conversations. So start consultation, exactly. That, that's all. Yeah, I, I support that. <coughs> other thoughts? So we, uh, going forward, um, well, this were, this is in the basket, the in-basket for LMAC or if there are community groups or whomever, this is not something that we're gonna move forward with. Is that where we are? That's what I am thinking right now. Is we're not. Um, not that you would if, if a community group brought in the information. I think what I heard yeah. Carmen say, she said another thing that yes. we're thinking about. But <laughs> one of them is to be real right mindful and not, as we're building a relationship, to be really careful that we don't do something in, in the interest of doing good that has an unintended consequence. That, that has an effect on the larger relationship of building effort. I think that's part of what I've Which is good guidance. Yeah. I like your words. Your Thank words, you. your words were good. Good words. Thank you. Good words. <laughs> <laughs> if Alman doesn't want to take it on, then Alman doesn't take it on. Just for my it would just be yeah. So my question would be, what would you like to ask Elmac? Uh, we, we currently are gonna start a very small kind of uh, needs assessment around our cultural communities and the issues that are happening in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you were, how do I state the question to Elmac? Are you interested in researching this uh, name of, of Evans and Hunts and how it relates to Longmont, Colorado. There may be somebody on the Elmac board that individually would be interested, but that's all I would ask. And if they say no, do your idea with ask for consultation. consultation. What yeah. what does Elmac recommend to the city council? And how would they rank that as far as their priority? Exactly. It really needs to be done. Thank exactly. You. But it, it doesn't have to ask. Yeah. Carmen, it seems to me that what you, what LMAC is already doing is, is having the awareness of the cultures who they are communities. And when what done looks like there is, is that the community says, 
oh, this in our community is insensitive, let's change it, rather than us imposing it on the community, as it happened before. And so I, I think that, well, we, the public, not necessarily the council, but the public needs to get more behind the LMAC and support their events and donate and, you know, all of that stuff to enable them to, to do their multicultural outreach in our city now that in terms of the approach they're taking, it's not really the right, right approach. So let's do a real fast thumbs up and thumbs down if you want to grasp LMAC if you're interested in um, pursuing, pursuing each, uh, a discussion. And would Councilman McCoy want to come and? Okay. They're meeting the second Monday of every month at noon, typically. So I know that wouldn't work, but we could figure out a way around. And I want to, I want to just very quickly uh, tell you about how things like that got initiated. So uh, many, many. Well, everybody here knows that the largest day of the <coughs> in the state of Colorado is here in Long Beach. So we had the largest largest day of the dead celebration. Does everybody know what question was asked that started it? So our former uh, museum director who's passed away, uh, Mar uh, Martha Clevenger, asked the question as to why do Latinos not come to the museum? And we gathered a group of Latinos and we asked that question and they said we didn't know we were welcome and what do you have that would be meaningful and attract us and we created the day of the dead and that became more and more bigger right much like inclusive communities we've outgrown all of our facilities sometimes those questions are really helpful to us finding a way to really um, highlight our communities of color, our GLBT community, as an asset in our community and not that deficit lens. So I point that out. Um, Cinco de Mayo is the only celebration in the state of Colorado where there is no alcohol and no tobacco. It is family oriented. We don't know those historical pieces that also created change or those historical stories that also inclusive communities started because uh, there was a group of folks that felt that council, our decision makers, did not see our communities of color. So we brought them into the Civic Center Mall and when the Tongans and the Peruvians were having a dance off and no one wanted to go into city council meeting, <laughs> city council said, well, I think we should find another place. But the interactions, the relationships uh, that happen, I think were very uh, important. Uh, everybody knows Rita Lu mm -hmm. and the amazing work that she has done around uh, Chinese New Year's. So I think those, those relationships are key. Thank you. Okay, the task master and he is back. <laughs> and you have four main areas and our question is what does success look like? So shall we start with housing? Is that your most important top priority? Throw them out to me. What does success look like to you all when you have achieved housing? I have one. Yes. That the people who work here can afford to live here. Um, that if they so choose to live here, I'm thinking about our teachers or our police department or some staff. Can you live here? So, love it. What else? When we have no more safe lots. Because they're no longer here. Yep. Okay. I'm assuming. Great. Because they're no longer here. Exactly. Yeah. What else? What does success look like? Does that mean that there is always a vacancy when someone needs it? Because that's what no more safe lots would mean. Would that be a sub yeah. Well, the safe lots are people who live and work here. 
So it tags along with what Susan's saying that would be true. Sure. No, but I, I mean, if we have no more safe lots, what safe lots are usually short transitions, but if somebody falls out of their um, housing and and they can be rehomed pretty quickly, um, is is does when you say no more safe lots, does that mean that that there are enough units that there's always a vacancy? I would suggest enough units, mm -hmm. but if you want there to always be a vacancy, there's also this balance of trying to make sure that you don't have too many vacancies. Yes, yeah. yes, but there are always vacancies. How about there's not always. just in the LHA, but in all right. the communities, there are always vacancies. Actually, there are enough units for those who need them. Probably not about numbers of units. Certainly, I, I would I would salute what's up there. Um, but God, if we could somehow, for me, success would be living in a community less characterized by units. You know, and I don't know, you know, how much, how how responsible we are or can be for you know bending or altering you know that perception. But Harold, I think in one of your slides yesterday. Um, you had a, you used the, the other acronym of, uh, uh, not Henry, but yes. Yeah, yes. Please, in my diagram. If somehow we could, you know, alter that. That was actually Glenn's inspirational goal. Yes. Well, I saw it somewhere and I got my, my attention that we could. What well, have some influence on it? I know we can't, you know, own it. Or we, you know, people aren't going to change their minds till they change their hearts. But somehow, we gotta figure out how to address that. Maybe it's just basic economics that, you know, the fear that people have that, uh, that a different kind of housing unit in my neighborhood somehow is gonna diminish my housing value, which I don't think there's any evidence for. And it's the crime stuff that. Or it's, or it's the crime issue. Yeah. Yeah, where council plays into this, and you go, what do we, what do we need from you? Um, I think in the last uh, community conversation, or not, no, the last copy of council, I believe it was. Mayor Peck and Council Member Yarborough that were at that and they were curious. And I think when you talk about that, they said, we need housing and here's why we need housing because of these issues. And I think there was really kind of that point of digging into that topic, I guess, in my backyard by saying, here's what we need. And so I think those are examples to say, well, how do we own it? And what do we, I think that's what we need to talk about. So I think there's a way to incorporate that. Yeah. Well, it does seem to, for me, to be something that the council can have in some impact. There's a matter of mobility. So um, as people move through their lives, where they need to live change changes. I hear because of being on the senior advisory board, you see people trapped in their big houses and they either have the ability to downsize because the stock doesn't exist or because it's so it's as expensive as their house you know um and, and, and nor do they have the ability to um, make their house more accessible um that would allow them to stay there so that's uh it, it's it's a nuance but it is also a co-related thing um, you know how do you the, how do you make your upper story into an ADU and how do you find the money to do that so that you can still live on the bottom? There, there's all kinds of, of, of real there are barriers that we don't know we have in our code because doing those things is so expensive. I think it's a great point. We almost need to layer in that life cycle journey and journey map new home buyers to this point, maximize your yeah, needs, and then I think that's a good way to think about it. So Marsha, I, I characterize that as housing is accessible and flexible for various stages of life. Everybody who wants to move up or down can. Mm -hmm. up or down.
Any other ones on housing? We're building this fast. So, the only other question, yeah, and it's something we heard from Shaquille yesterday. It, 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 uh, in the first slide that Glenn put up, um, he had the two comment, the two uh, excerpts from the code to speak to, I think, the missing middle that we heard, that we've talked about before. Um, uh, I guess I, if I had a better understanding of uh, what percentage of, of, of new housing stock that's either proposed or under development would fit the category missing middle? And if there's anything we're doing with code, because in the lightning line, that would be a question I would have. Is there anything we have to do with code that would enable or incent or signal that we that we'd like to see one of the missing middle developed? So yeah, we can answer it. Um, Valerie has it. Right. <laughs> to you. Keep that slide up. I have a whole lot of slides. <laughs> um, there's a lot of code work we have to do. Uh, because I think you said today, is there anything coming in the housing stock that would fall into the thing talk before stuff be attainable? I mean, I think the closest project that I've seen was uh, some uh, townhome duplex off of 66 in Alpine. And while the, I did go into them by the way. I didn't. While they say from the 500s, the reality was it was 650, I think it was in the lower end of some of those. And so I don't I mean, I think we're starting to see some of it come in a little bit, or we think it may come in, but the economics are really driving that. Uh, we see zero for sale, affordable outside of what hab habitat for humanity is doing. We had the presentation a couple of years ago from the consultant guy, and it was all about the missing middle. It was a good presentation. And we identified everything from street widths to sidewalk widths to tree, numbers of trees, you know, the, and building materials, neighborhood character, all those things that would have shown up in code. But we've never gone back to it. We, I, that I recall, we've never had a follow-on conversation I don't want yeah. to look at Joan just because she's. Well, no, because I was the planning director then. <laughs> <laughs> so I believe council did not direct us to move forward with several of those things. So missing middle yeah. could be a lot of things, right? That's the direction. Yeah, and you know, it could be as simple as, you know, do you allow two ADUs per lot? I mean, you know, do you allow more duplex, triplex? I think some of those, while we've changed our code and have loosened up what the, what the standards are between a attached single family and detached single family. I think we have a lot of NIMBY around yeah. those types of things in existing single family neighborhoods. We are a predominantly four unit per acre density community, yeah. right? So that shift of that kind of housing, I think is absolutely um, on board, but I, it's gonna it's gonna take some- Feels like it's an interpret that around the when I yeah. that. Yeah. But, but, yes. but, so the success indicator would be that if we could calculate Percentages of new housing stock that fit a particular category, we could mark improvements in that type of housing stock over the next five years or two years or whatever. Well, part of what's going to come out of this, as you can see, um, this is what we were working on the last couple of years. You all approved the price cal calculations, um, you all gave us direction on the securities, the, the housing assessment that's coming in. It is something that um, I think will inform some of this. I'm starting to see the preliminary numbers. It's shocking. Just on the rental side, we're short. Um, and uh, that's the piece that, you know, that'll inform, I think, setting the basis of how we're comparing and what we're doing. Um, and I think as you're, and you can see some of these other code changes that are associated with it. Um, the, how, uh, the attainable fee waiver, that's what you all have directed us to do. That's gonna be coming on April 4th. That's what took a long time to figure out um, the deed restrictions associated with it and then the design standards uh, to allow more flexibility with utility setbacks because the way we're gonna work ourselves through this housing piece, and I think Councilmember Rodriguez has talked about this, is, is 
because the, the model that we have in our single family structure will not produce attainable and, and affordable homes. And so we're having to look at how do we maximize density to really get those for sale products so that you can actually have a wealth generation component to this because if people are always renting, there's no wealth generation and you keep people in cycles. And as you're thinking of what does success look like, I think there's another indicator that you know I would throw out is if, you know maybe and he can work with this, but what I told you all yesterday about housing is I think how we communicate it to, the, to our residents is really important because we have a housing crisis that will become a financial crisis and an economic development crisis as we can't hire people and we make it live in our communities and at times it can become an operational crisis. So if we have to continue to relook at our boundaries to where our operation staff can live with response times, and we have to keep pushing that further out. There is a tangible impact of the service we provide to the community. And it's not just us, it's the schools. And, and it's the employer base. And as I said yesterday, the ultimate risk is people can't hire their the employees to work in these places. And then they end up having to make other decisions, which then creates a spin cycle that you, you see in cities all the time. And look at the Midwest and see where they suffer through that. So, kind of rehashing some things to have you all think about what does success look like. You know, more, you know, let's back out to like 30,000 feet. What does success look like? Um, is that question on the table? Because uh, I don't know whether we do it with demonstration neighborhoods or highlighting the demonstration neighborhoods that we already have, um, uh, like like Blue Vista, which is so gorgeous in the summertime, you know. Um, but we need acceptance, you know. We don't need nice, lovely townhome developments. At, at home farm and, and at champion greens and and the resistance is astounding um, we need to do something to obtain acceptance and and uh, I, I think some model PUDs in one of the areas of change um, you know I just talked and Taylor's not here now but he also talked to uh, a journalist from the Guardian um, who is using writing about prospect and why it is both a perfect and an imperfect um, example of new urbanism and why it didn't change the culture of the community, or at least I hope that's what she writes about. But but we do model communities that I know uh, it's gonna be a lot of work, right? <laughs> but but that but but there need to be ways to change the public attitude about density and, and seeing how how wonderful a community that is more dense, more walkable, more varied can actually be. Well, I was just going to say, in, in a certain concept, you can only do that by actually building it in the sense that I remember all the pushback around the <coughs> Roosevelt Park apartments, right? And then now nobody bats an eye when they go by. Right? Uh, and I think it's the same thing. Change is scary for a lot of people, but once it happens, they tend to adapt to it. The adaptability of, of the human, you know, of humans is, is pretty remarkable once they're faced with it. And so sometimes you just gotta make hard decisions and put the things where they <coughs> Do you think so? Are we going to do it all? Mm -hmm. Yes. So? Early childhood. What does success look like? Is it childhood or child care? Well, 
Yeah, I've always seen this. This is Carol's. Early childhood, which would include childhood education. Okay. Yeah, the way I've always heard it is early childhood care yeah. education. Does that seem appropriate? Actually, it's referred frequently to early care and education. Okay. Okay. Success. Yeah. Every student. At least within our city limits. To the degree that parents want them in a place, uh, are placed in an environment that is uh, developmentally appropriate, affordable, accessible, quality. and high quality. Just a tough question. <laughs> should probably add zero to five. Okay, and zero to five, because we did have this as three to four. Right. Yeah, so every, every child, every child yeah. zero, zero to five. Can, can we get the neighborhood aspect of it in there somewhere? We should be able to, we should be able to build one in a, in a, in a location where it's not there. Um, it's just like a food desert. So part of what we're looking at is child care deserts. So there's no child care deserts. So that's part of that. the accessible, affordable. Yeah. Yeah. You want to say child yeah. and accessible. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. when, when, when you're a parent who has to work, you want your kid to either be close to home or close to work. You don't want to have to drive 25 minutes if your kid has fallen on their head nearby. Do whatever that is. Work or yeah. home or whatever. I'm going to do a real quick duplicate of this slide. Because it's getting real tiny, which is yeah. my problem and not yours. Okay. What else? Uh, well, I just look maybe. That may be it. No, I'm going to add every. Every five-year-old, at least living within the city limits of Long Island, I wish we could expand that to at least the same Great Valley School District, arrives in kindergarten school ready. You know, I'm not ready to put visions or anything on any other cities. Uh, I'm, yeah. I, I'm not. Yeah, he said, Mom, I'd like to. I know. Oh, I thought he was left. Sorry. Sorry. I'd like to. I'm not. Okay, we've got it. Already for kindergarten. Arrive school ready? Yeah, arrive right at kindergarten yeah. school, school ready. ready. Our school ready. ready. Arrive at kindergarten school ready. School ready. School ready. School school ready. 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 School Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I think I'm not sure if the other council members probably got that Oops. string of emails Sorry. all similar. Hang on, Hang on Aaron. I want to make sure everyone's able to read it. Yeah, okay, go ahead. So All right. I think most of the council members probably also got emails in the last day or two that were all specific to connectivity issues mm -hmm. where, yes, we have bike infrastructure here, but it doesn't connect anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And so I would think that connectivity is built out or, or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. you know, arts, full connectivity is, is built. Something along those lines, I don't know. Do you think ubiquitous connectivity? It's full connected, or do you think it should be? Did you say ubiquitous? Yeah. 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 Y
that are that left town sort of winding sort of streets that are so difficult to get any sort of external transportation down that it's uh, uh, was really cool looking and, and edgy at the time when we were putting it in, but completely disconnected to the reality of getting people from point A to point B without using the car. That's very exciting. <laughs> okay, one more. Everybody all right? Give me a thumbs up if we're good. It's good. There you go. Nice job. Come on back. Steve. Give some extent. Implement the plan, right? <laughs> Get you too narrow minded about that. Or seize the opportunity to lightning round. Um, the other thing that occurred to me was Council Waters in this particular section mentioned the idea of being able to take seize the opportunities as they come up in this area. Um, you know, so North or Main Street, are you specifically to the downtown area or? Are we talking about the extension? You will see the whole. The whole, because I, yeah. Okay. This brings me up to a, a, a thing that's kind of always bugged me a little bit. Because sometimes we get suggestions of what Longmont should get from Dr. Gog in regards to the sort of industry that comes in and that sort of thing. And it always felt like it was kind of like, hey, I think you guys should get this. That stuff, but you know, but might have been kind of edgy and cool, or maybe uh, diversify our our uh, employment base was kind of sometimes the looked over, and it just kind of was one of those things that I was just kind of, but uh, you know, stuck in the back of my mind is kind of an issue that when you say seize opportunities, how? I mean, because sometimes, like you mentioned today about having a, a, a that you should sit, you should come in and, and relocate here and everything. But you know, are we are we are we attracting those those uh, diverse businesses? You know, and we're seizing opportunities. How? So, so your point is not only seize the opportunities as they present themselves, but also work actively work to attract opportunities. Yeah. Yes, uh, to that point, you know, Aaron. To your point about Dr. Parkinson makes me laugh a little bit is that recently, and I would say in the past year and a half, there's a lot of pushback about the talks from the directors on some of the things that they bring up. Because as we all individually look at our municipalities and overall region for Dr. Parkinson, we fit. So um, a, a lot of it. So not only actively work to attract opportunities, but opportunities that we want in our city. <coughs> Not just anything that comes along, but I think you have some vision plans that indicate what the mainstream corridor quarter kind of plan is. Well, for me, I know we had entertainment and all of that. Um, when I went and visited the high schools in Lebanon, and I, we all know that the youth want something that's fun. And it will be really nice that if we can have something. Um, with the youth in mind. Where we can have our younger generation that will also uh, utilize that space and be proud of it. I have to, I would go a little further on that. I would just, you know, okay. yeah. That keeps our youth in our city. I mean, many of them go to other cities, so it would be not just you. Educate ourselves on what I don't know how to say it, but um, up to date. Like, like Harold brought up gaming uh, because that is the new thing that kids want. Well, it doesn't have to be just kids. I mean, young adults too. I mean, young, young adults go to Denver because there's nothing here. There's nothing to do here. Show you that a young adult is cute. <laughs> you're, you're, <laughs> she's done that herself. So, right? And that's actually that's an economic development thing too. Um, <coughs> yeah, 
Yeah, it's kind of like those uh, movies in the park, you know, that, and that sort of thing. Like, could you make a uh, an area that was almost like a drive-in movie theater for gaming sort of aspects, and certain aspects of the certain times of the year that would be <coughs> show up one one weekend, maybe have a gaming uh, uh, aspect outdoors for the next week. Uh, I don't know how to make that work to fit here. The bullets <coughs> two and three, for me, imply a real proactive approach on the part of city staff. Um, in in this list of of uh, this part of the list of priorities, because there are others in the list, uh, this seemed it just feels like this one. As much as I love the work we've done, ought to be more opportunistic as opposed to proactive or responsive. But but you, but there's some work required to draw something to which you can respond, which would be a real clear, crisp, compelling vision of possibilities in this part of town. It's not labor, maybe there, maybe it's labor intensive to develop that kind of vision. We've got a head start on it. But, um, but, but if we're going to list two and three, that has, if that's how we're going to measure progress, then a year from now, you know, there ought to be some accountability. So well, how did we promote and who did we promote to? And I'm just not certain that that's where we need to put you right now. Yeah. I would feel like number three, you sort of acted on last time by asking the services to mm -hmm. you know, make recommendations around yeah. the stadium, yeah. money, which I think fits right into the fact. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, how is the river corridor chain doing? How is the, the collective impact river corridor chain doing? Maybe the council needs uh, uh, a readout from them before. Um, uh, before we uh, codify that bullet point completely, so maybe this is work with Ali Yeah, that's what I was going to suggest. Mm -hmm. Because if Ali Miki knows what council is looking that's for, good. then rather than just mm -hmm. um, work, commercial places for people to work, like, I mean, we've got Smuckers and we're getting Costco and everything, can we also have a different vision that Ali Miki would keep your eyes open? That helps that to see yeah. the opportunities. So, um, success for me, especially with Main Street, and I hear it oftentimes because the east side, I don't know if you get some from North Main, not North Main, oh. or two side, oh, oh, you're sure you get equal amount as I do. Um, you know, that all sections of Main Street are, uh, you know, that have robust economic opportunities, businesses, and, and vitality. I mean, I'll let you. You know, do your run your magic on those words, <laughs> but um, I, you know, I would like to see that all all areas are given equal uh, attention to. And do you mean that you would want to approach them for the additional taxation that's the downtown downtown has? You know, so mean, yeah, it, it, I mean, it could be you know be, if we're exploring the area of an uptown authority, do, you know that yeah. something Harold and I have. Yeah, so Joey's talking about this. I think you know. I'm gonna latch on the comments you all made about where others can do it, but maybe we reach out to the chamber yeah. oh, and ask the chamber to really lead that initiative with the businesses on North Main Street to mm -hmm. to look at the creation of the general improvement district or something so that we can have the same funding sources. It's a time set. I mean, if, if we do it, then. It's the same people that are doing housing. Yeah, doing yeah, no, things. but if there are other people that we can engage with to have them take the lead, absolutely. The merchants need to take the lead. Yeah, the chamber could guide, to facilitate that. Because I think when I talk to business owners, a lot of it is they don't know how. I mean, that's like right. they don't have time. So yeah. if they have somebody who's facilitating that and leading the way, right. they, I think a lot of people would get on. Yeah, they yell at me because downtown is my important issue. Why do you do that all the downtown? It's Downtown gave us themselves. That's what I explained to. So, could we just add in there also the Latino Chamber? Because mm -hmm. there's that mm -hmm. section of 9th Avenue there that has such yes. a strong uh, grouping of, of uh, Latino owned businesses that it just yeah, seems like it's such a logical yeah. spot that have, have that really developed in such a strong. Yeah, even for the more. Yeah. Yeah. One of the challenges of North Main is the number of, of 
businesses that are in buildings owned by a landlord someplace else. Mm -hmm. In contrast to them. Yes. Yeah. Right? It was the property owners downtown that voted, they created the district and voted, right, to, to, to tax themselves. Mm -hmm. In uptown, uh, that's going to require landowners who are not business owners. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the tension of yeah. the minority. Mm -hmm. um, and I, there, you know, there, I was in a conversation once with folks about where to start with that, maybe in terms of a, uh, a co-op, in terms of purchasing and maintenance mm -hmm. facility, custodial facilities, as a way to test the ideas. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that is where maybe I'll do that, I'll do maybe the chamber can help me, just to just see what's possible. But I know that the ownership issues are so different from yeah. uptown. But maybe we could get one of our local banks to put together an investment plan that, that would persuade both the tenants and the landlords to somehow come up with, with a solution or would enable them to. Start anymore, I think it would be a, a little hard to, to manage. So, my proposal is for you um, to rely on your CEO now to bring back goals and metrics that would follow along with these desires of six <laughs> <laughs> I thought he had too much to do. Well. <laughs> How do you know what to do? Yeah, I thought, what was on bullet three on yesterday's slide? <laughs> or the next and the last slide. Bullet three, you know, goals and measurable outcomes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think you've given us something. You offered that up. Yeah. I thought yeah. you yeah. offered that up. <laughs> I, I feel like I heard that, yeah. I guess. Yeah, she, <laughs> what this does is what we're doing is really keeping you here, and then we will take this. It's manageable enough. You know, if you look at the last list, it looks like this. This is manageable enough that we can take this. And I think in fairly short order, dig into it. This will be the work that this group is going to be engaging in in the next few weeks in terms of how we do this. Obviously, we'll bring in strategic integration into this and we'll build that <coughs> onto this so that we will report to you, but you will also have the ability to go in on your own and see it. Then it can be interesting. Can, can, can we talk about this going forward as our work plan, not the council work plan? The long yes. work plan. Well, it, it always bothered me a little bit that, that you didn't own our work plan, not you. I mean, the staff didn't necessarily own our work plan. It, it shouldn't be our work plan. It's the council work plan. It should be something on which we are all working. Yeah, very music kind of role for us. I agree. I think I think this is a little bit of a, this was a different process where it was a collective yeah. give and take as we were moving through this, which this is our work plan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm recognizing that it is five until three, and I know that really our road needs to head off at three. Um, do you want to offer any ordinances before you go? And then we'll take I'm a break and say a few and we'll be at three. Well, then a lightning round it is. Are you ready? Okay. What ordinances would you like to review? Recognizing everything you heard today about workload and priorities and everything you just uh, laid out there for us, what would you like to review? So I've got one that doesn't have to be immediate, but maybe has 18 months to be worked out. And that is um, uh, section 14.32.040 residential self generation rate. I only got 14.3. What? 14.32.040. 14. 14. Okay. Residential self generation rate. Um, uh, it can uh, allow 200% of last year's consumption and fix the problem where if you don't have access to that, you can't get permitted at all. Um, and it needs to be tied into uh, 
some incentives for uh, either solar point bat uh, solar plus battery or other electrification incentives, and it needs to be tied to the capacity of the neighborhood. So you know, just just like um, you can only have so many short term rentals in an area, or I don't even know whether we ended up doing that or not, but we discussed it pretty hard. Um, but similarly, um, it needs to be kind of a first come first serve situation uh, to uh, tie it to the capacity of the grid in the neighborhood, or the consumer can pay for the upgrade if the consumer can. We have consumers who have already done that, paid for upgraded service to their house. And I'm not trying to dictate all of that. I'm just saying all this stuff has to be in it. And that, and we aren't going to know how, what, what needs to be there for about 18 months, and so I thought it, it doesn't have to happen that fast. I heard you so, mention the word storage. Did you want to put in Yeah, I said storage. Yeah, yeah. I said okay. in, integrate uh, solar plus battery or electrification plus uh, plus solar. Right here, David, storage. Storage and another column because they are tied to the capacity. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sort of separate item. Right, yeah. Can't, we don't want to legislate getting you in trouble. <laughs> okay, what else? This is a lightning round. I didn't I, I, I just, I'm not going to give you code numbers. But whatever whatever we have need to address in code to address the missing middle, the, the, the bundle of miss, miss, missing middle, maybe I should say the bundle of code changes to address the missing middle housing stock that we've talked about before, we just didn't get direction, and is a reflection of what we heard from Shakir yesterday. That would be one. Secondly, um, it's I think we ought to we ought to not to ignore Huck Walk yeah. anymore. That we ought to get back. I don't know if it's the STR or the S the uh, uh, short term rental ordinance to to refocus on that and what we are allowing or not and the reasons why. STRs for ADUs. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. ADUs and STRs because it's it's actually safer if the tenant is right there on site. That's true. Yeah, well, but I, I don't need to argue. Let's don't talk about that. Just, right just want to get it. Right there. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. And I had a conversation with Harold, so you kind of he kind of knows. Pardon? We had a conversation about this. You know what you were going to bring back, at least give to me. Yeah. So the question was, um, uh, Susie had been. Hearing the ADU conversations, and if it was part of a, a strategy that communities are using to, to build the affordable housing for families, in my answer was yes. If you look nationally, that is one of the strategies that they talk about. And we have information on that. We can send it to all of the council. Well, that's part of what we've been hearing from them yeah. as well. So, Sam, so, you know, can you put in parentheses there of uh, Governor Polis's uh, so new zoning policy, zone by right, I think that's what he's calling it. Because I think that addresses ADUs. And I would like, before we go into this, I want to know what his policy is going to be. And what makes it through the legislature. Exactly. Right. What about some things that we've heard from folks that have talked to us before in council, sent us emails to Strider's Point uh, uh, 16 years ago, talking about how we need uh, to uh, have some sort of uh, uh, transportation grid system. Uh, something that the U.S. staff talks about that, uh, whether we do it ourselves or whether we, we uh, bring an RTD into the initiative. Okay. Um, since we are, which we should, address uh, HUD's um, ADU, ADU, we also should address lands. Yeah, uh, yeah. marijuana. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what that even yeah, says. Yeah, I don't know what play. Cannabis hospitality. Yeah, cannabis hospitality. Cannabis hospitality. Yeah. 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 License? Yeah, it's license. Okay. Yeah. House deal. Um, what was it? We all know that. Yeah, 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 we Say local transit, auto, local motorized transit, or or micro transit, or something, because grid is prescriptive. Grid may not may not be the solution. A, I mean, yeah, micro micro transit, or get filled with the system. system. Yeah, because because that okay, we shot. That's right. And Strider was nodding behind you. So. Oh, 
did we ever resolve, I don't think we have, resolved conflicts between uh, the inclusion, how, inclusionary housing ordinance that we adopted and what is in, in our uh, land use codes. Uh, where I, I, I can go back to my files and dig out the conflicts. I don't think they have ever been resolved, but maybe, you know, maybe I missed something. There was, there was, I think they were to some degree tied into the, the 11 inclusionary housing issues we were going to deal with once upon a time. We dealt with nine of them. And I think two of them, but I. To that point, Sandy, I don't think Governor Polis is new zoning policy. That should be land use policy, since that's what it is. Hi, Governor Polis is land use policy. There you go. Because it, it does address the inclusionary housing and what we need. So that ties in there. Yes. Okay. So we had a conversation a while back uh, with water staff about how we meter this don't really meter similarly the the irrigation of uh, green areas around subdivisions that are along arterials. I know that's one I've gotten from staff before even to look at. Modernizing that. Can we expand that a little bit to say looking at our, what is it, our streets, taps, or just free water for our arterials, taps, right? So that section of the code, and then that ties probably to central landscaping standards. Yeah, the landscaping standards. Can, can we bring yeah. that all in with landscaping standards and alignment with our sustainability plan? If we can expand that, because that's what we've been talking about, that landscaping standards, free water tap, sustainability plan, except that we're kind of moving at different places, so if we can take that a little. And, and that's one that actually looked at a lot of us, too. Well, we're actually just talking about it. Can you, as long as we're doing the community irrigation, I've always been um, wondering about school districts. With are they metered for the, for how they irrigate the same as residents or HOAs or they're, they're, they're in from a um, total system, they're in at a commercial level. The school district does have raw their own raw water, and so they use that in a different way because that that's their ownership. Okay. So all right. Okay, so um, when I was in a training with Valerie and Lou a couple of weeks ago. Carol, we were talking about how we're using next light with cameras and parks and stuff like that. Is there anything that we are in a position that would get us in trouble in regards to filming people and stuff like that in public places and just making sure that that's not something we should dress down so that we stay to uh, keep it? We have a data governance team that does work on what that privacy is looks like and so we do have a, a data governance agreement for the cameras and what that looks like and that's been really good. So well, if, if you watch the video show last night, mm -hmm. it was actually on Long Rock. Well, they were utilizing private cameras. And so between that when you're in the public space mm -hmm. and even with private cameras. Okay, that's a different question. That's a good question we talked about septic um, and applying that um, in 24-hour amenities in parks. Or, I, I'm sorry, 12 months out of the year amenities in parks. We prevent a lot of crime just by letting people use the restroom in the winter, um, especially if it's a septic designed. <coughs> is that? It's not an ordinance. That's it's not an ordinance. We're operational. More operational, but our group okay. did, did go to the subject training and, and they are bringing back recommendations. Excellent. Okay. Any other ordinances? No, how about think of all talking about expanding? <laughs> that's, that's an ordinance? Uh, well, I'm just I'm wondering if, I don't know, I'm just trying to think of how to. That's right, that's what I just I'm off. just looking like, you know. Okay. Any other ordinances that you feel would be cleaned up or modernized? Oh, okay. Okay. I like to think of too. Yeah, it's like because, because we did get a lot of buy-in for building the kind of neighborhoods that will demonstrate um, the new style of living that we want to promote. And also because the 
model of, of gathering people in, in big office buildings has kind of collapsed. And they need to you know, be more excused than they are. 4.10.010, eliminate the 50% requirement in sub item E8 um, in favor of some percentage that's lower, like five to 10%. Because office intensive districts don't exist anymore, but we do need intensively mixed use neighborhoods. 4.10. Yeah, 4.10.010. Oh, Eliminate the percentage of what? There's a 50% there's a requirement for 50%, re no more than 50% um, residential in these mixed use districts. Okay. So zone code is 15. Pardon? Zone code is 15. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the latches. I was trying not to say it. We're talking about residential metro districts. Oh, okay. Yep. That's exactly what I thought you were talking about in the first in the first second. And it's 50. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. And our AP is still down because we're not building that way anymore. We're not moving anything that way. Is, is this right then, Marcia? Yeah. Eliminate the percentage of no more than 50% residential and mixed use lower than 5 percent Yeah. A, a study would be needed to figure out what the, the right threshold is. We don't want any, we don't want to build purely residential stuff, but figure out what the right mixed use area should be. Maybe you could figure out the right. And, you know, there are things like, like putting in um, ground source heat exchange subsystems that would need to be special, need special finance. So it's an important justification for that. Join once. Uh, we're going <laughs> to have, if we can add, and this is probably pretty important, uh, for economic development ordinances. What would they be? Yeah. <laughs> Um, we just have work. Yeah, yeah, we just have everything in four point like seven two three four point seven nine. Eugene and Jigal have not been talking about the really necessity. It's Eugene referred to as a Frankenstein code section, so we'd like to really make sure <laughs> that's really addressing how we want to bring those incentives forward to council. And Jessica, and we had started that like before COVID, and so. And I should mention that your council packet was a table of other ordinances that we had planned to bring forth. So there were some for public safety, there were some for mental health and safety. Yeah, and public safety and electric roads are two areas that we sponsored something. So will they just be coming back to us during those quarters? Or you know, those kinds of ordinance changes to have to bring back as operational for pieces. Yeah. We just wanted to get your brainstorms quick as you said. And to be clear with you all, so obviously we talked about core services, we talked about what your goals are, and then we talked about this. And so the decision making process is going to be for ordinances related to core services, yes. um, your goals, ordinances related to that, and then those that are tangential based on the that are not, like where there's not a direct connection, we will work within our capacity. So some of these are related to housing, so obviously that will slide in there. But some of them that aren't directly touching one of your primary goals, that may have to wait a, a little bit. So back to just real quick, when you said some of these would be related to housing, can we review any ordinances uh, regarding substandard housing, um, the condition of those housing, and things like that? Maybe I can see the means to Yes. Yeah, I had that. It was at the bottom of my list because I couldn't find the ordinances. Our having to do with the ordinances are like it can't be fewer than this many square feet and it can't, the building, the ceilings have to be at least this tall. The state having the habitability for a dwelling unit are really weak, you know, like they have to have a toilet and two sinks or something. <coughs> um, but we can strengthen our habitability ordinances, could we not? Currently, so currently we're adopting the uh, property maintenance code that's part of the family of ICC codes, the international codes, right? Okay. That's what we adopt, that's what they um, 
Alexandria moves back to and work through. So I think Glenn and I can talk to them and take a look at that. Okay, because the, 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 what we have now is really weak. Mm -hmm. You can barely live in it. No, no air conditioning, no um, hot water or anything. I mean, it's beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Am I wrong? I, I don't know. Look, we can look. We have to have running water. Yeah, we have to have running water, but not necessarily on it. All right. Now go on once. Go on twice. Okay, we're going to take a five minute break to let everyone who is here from the public that has not signed up for public invited papers feel free to do so. Are everybody ready? Yes. All right, we're going to be back for. Okay, my name is Ruby Bowman, 1512 Lake Anne Drive, Longmont. If one drives north on Highway 159 from the town of San Luis, the San Luis Valley, one will see an imposing mountain, Swamp of Peak. This mountain or Sidichini is one of the four primary sacred mountains of the Navajo people or the dead. It represents the eastern boundary of the Navajo traditional lands and is part of our creation stories. It is important to me to hide the dead. Just north of Blanca, near the town of Cresto, is the peak of the Sunway de Cristo, named after Kit Carson. Kit Carson was an American soldier who implemented a scorched earth campaign against the Navajo people. He was responsible for carrying out the federal government's plan of rounding up the people and making them walk hundreds of miles from northern Arizona to an internment camp at Bosque Redondo in eastern New Mexico. It's known as the Long Walk. The Navajo people suffered immensely. Just like the Arapaho and Cheyenne people who suffered that same creed. It's an abomination that a peak honoring Kit Carson, a murderer, is near a Navajo sacred mountain. It's an abomination that a street in Longmont is named after John Evans, the one who stoked the pines that brought about the San Creek Massacre. The city prides itself as being a sister city of the northern Arapaho. Of Wind River. Please honor that relationship by removing John Evans' name from Obama forever. And I appreciate Councilmember McCoy bringing this issue to our attention. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Schnellsberg. <clears throat> Hey there, I'm Mike Schnatzmeyer of 69 Rover Road, and I don't have a prepared state, but I've got it down a few notes. At first, just like to let everyone know how incredibly thrilled I am at what transpired here today. Uh, 15 years ago, when I first spoke to city council, I addressed them in the council chambers about the imminent threat of a 100 year floodplain or a flood event that could cause $300 million of damage how the threat of this was exacerbated by climate change, and how, if they were proactive, they could build a vision for the river corridor as an economic engine for the city and a vital cultural and social part of the city, going back to the original reason that the Chicago colony came here way back when. So to see the change over these years, and of course we had a flood event that helped accelerate things, you know, for good or for bad, but to see the change. I'd just really like to acknowledge and applaud the City Council for everything they've done, for the citizens, for the staff, for the incredible change and the difference between night and day that I've seen over the past 15 years and the courage it took of this community, the citizens and particularly the staff, to make that change happen. So I'd just like to acknowledge and really applaud that. It's just night and day that's incredible. Um, I would like to add something to the conversation that I did not see brought into here today. And again, I didn't prepare a statement, I just jotted down some things, but I would like to see more conversation around the issue of systems thinking, because the issues that we're talking about here are complex and they're all intertwined. It's what I would refer to commonly now as the poly crisis the intertwining of wicked systems like climate change, sustainability, environmentalism, housing, equity, uh, and a couple of things that were not mentioned 
the digital revolution and the threat of economic downfall if we don't get be proactive around the threat of the digital revolution and the impact that it could have on the jobs in the economy. Um, I'd like to, so a way to address systems thinking, a little more digestible, is the phrase multi solving If we can build more walkable, bikeable communities where you don't have to own a car, and you meet the basic human need of being able to live without being forced to own a car, you help address issues like budgetary issues that allow monies for health and education and all these issues we're talking about. Just quickly, equity, intergenerational equity. We have a moral obligation to provide a livable planet. We have My generation has a moral obligation to provide a livable planet and a flourishing future for the next generations in the unborn. And we need to go back into the conversation around equity. Um, lastly, housing is a bill that we need to talk about construction defects law, municipal code, code and public wealth funds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love your passion. Um, the next one is Brian. Can stay here oh, oh, okay. Uh, thanks. It's a long walk. Um, yeah, the uh, street name thing. So uh, some of you were here and remember when we came Sherrington Drive. One of our members was Ernie Greeley. His grandfather settled in Burlington in 1859, and Sherrington's people came through. And he was out plowing, and they said, you're coming with us, you're going to be one of them. He said, no, no, I'm not kidding. They put a gun to his head and said, yeah, you're coming, get on your horse. That's how they recruited some of the people to engage in the Santa Cruz Massacre. And once we, we lost in city council, you, some of you know who the council was then. <laughs> and then we got an approval to have a plaque explaining who Chippington was and then the city council who had voted us down then they said okay we'll change the name because they didn't want the history uh, known and um, uh, history I mean they've given me nice awards here in long life, but they prevented me from speaking for the last couple of years uh, Jim Jordan, a black lady poet, uh, wrote a book said some of us did not die. Some of us are still here. Uh, I talked to Bernard Lafayette two days ago. He was the first SNCC organ organizer to go in the cell in 1963. We had a good talk and uh, he said, I'm going to take Selma and put it on the map of the world. And, and we did. Uh, I was, I led the internal security force for the march on Montgomery. Um, marched all day and led security all night. And uh, I would like to have a chance to speak someday. But anyway, uh, part of it, the uh, digital, next slide. I own my trailer, but I have to rent the land. And they prevent us, violate us from getting next slide. We're not allowed to have it because they bribed the, they, they half a million dollars in two elections. They won the first election. Two years later, we defeated them. Everybody else got next life, but not us. We paid 80 times more per service because I live in a trailer and they're bribing a, a, a direct TV and Comcast are bribing the regional landlord. I don't know how much money, but it's big. They lied to us. They said the contract ran out in January and we should get it. No, no, I changed my mind. I decided, no, we'll steal it for a few more years. And we, we paid twice as much money for one fortieth of the service. So everybody else gets 80 times more of uh, uh, internet service than we do because we live in a trailer park. Thank you, sir. A lot of other things. Thank you. Thank you, Strider. Ethan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank 
I don't see anything if it comes in with the other one. It should heal. Mayor, members of council, city staff, I want to thank you again for a little bit more of your time. I promise Don won't have to stop me today. Uh, I said it yesterday, I'm going to say it again, and I will probably say it again tomorrow. The price of housing is too damn high. This is a choice that we collectively make. We make it every day through decisions and actions big and small. What the permitting office says to a homeowner wanting to do some work themselves. How the council responds to residents who have opinions about the built environment. The rules we put on the books, or allowed to stay on the books, about what can be built. Those choices all have rationale to them, sometimes good and sometimes bad. But the most important thing we can do in order to bring down the cost of housing is to examine those choices and revisit the ones that could be different. There is broad public support from a diverse group for re-examining those choices and making better ones. Some of us are here today, but I promise you there are many, many more of us. I say this as someone who is part of a generation filled with anxiety about what the future holds for us and who desperately want to set down roots in a community that we can afford to live in. <laughs> I also say that as someone who deeply loves this city and wants it to be the best version of itself that it can be, both for those people who made it what it is today, but also for the people who are going to live here in 100 years. I want to thank everyone in the room for their commitment this year for revisiting these choices on the Land Development Code, the Transportation Code, and a number of other uh, areas, and for the commitment to turn the corner on the cost of housing. It's going to be very exciting to work with you this year to make the city the best version of it. Thank you. Thank you, Shaquille. Uh, Trish Appleton. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Trish Appleton. I don't have a prepared speech, so that's it. I just wanted to really um, drive home two, two points um, that are important to me. One of them is the um, pedestrian friendly nature of Walmart as well as housing. First of all, um, I know that um, with the Vision Zero plan, it's something that's very important to Council. And first, I wanted to thank you um, and the engineering department for installing the crosswalk, the lighted crosswalk at uh, Mountain View and um, Deerwood. Um, however, as a blind person, I have to travel independently on my own, so I know that all of the hazards, um, even in downtown, there are many, many intersections where there's no no paint, no signs, nothing, and people just tear through there. So every day I go um, downtown, I feel like I'm taking my life in my own hands. And I just, I really have a vision for Longmont as a pedestrian first community. And so um, I just really want to drive home the importance of that. Um, because it isn't just good for me, it's good for anyone. So um, and in particular, I find helpful the flashing ones because they're up at a at a, at a viewpoint where the drivers can see. Um, so that's what I wanted to say first. Second of all, housing. Um, Walmart has a thriving musician and artist community, and it breaks my heart um, that it's so difficult for people who have been creating the lifeblood of this community to not be able to afford housing. So I would just want to encourage you to look at any ordinances, land use plans, something that will um, provide good solutions to make um, housing affordable for, for everyone, which is really a basic human right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trish. Um, Josie Lewis. Hey, hi everyone. I am also concerned about housing and I think imposing a vacancy tax would benefit Longmont and from the revenue generated from it, we would be able to build even more high density housing. Uh, I was doing research on this and someone making the median income in Boulder County, which is about $38,000 a year, is not able to afford to uh, rent even the cheapest studio apartment here because they require to make $5,000 or more than the median income to be considered a renter there. Um, I also saw that they, as of this morning, have 45 vacancies in the studio apartments, which is something like 11% of their total units, which is kind of unacceptable, like that's not the price to be set by the market. If it was, those would be filled. Um, and there would not be so many vacancies. So that's what I think. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Steve? Step. 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 Thank you. Step. 
Hello, City Council. I appreciate so much the progress the city has made the past couple of years and improving bikeability. Um, but as someone who, who rides a bike around town as a primary need, means of transport, um, I feel like there's still some work to be done. Um, sometimes, like when I was getting downtown by a third and taking the bike lane, the bike lane abruptly stopped and stuff at sunset. And third and sunset's also a pretty scary intersection for cyclists for other reasons. Um, people who cannot or do not want to drive a car shouldn't be treated as second class citizens. Um, and I shouldn't feel punished for doing the right thing of not contributing another car to traffic. Um, so I, I appreciate the, the focus on multi mobility and multimodal transport and walkability. Um, more housing options and walking distance to business, groceries, and cultural amenities would um, contribute a lot. Um, please make walking and biking a first class experience in one line. Audrey Atkins. Thank you, council members, uh, city staff, mayor. I think we need to start building more affordable, sustainable housing uh, that is also multi generational here in Longmont. Several years ago, I was traveling from Oregon, and I met someone named George who was from Greece. We fell into a conversation, and he was telling me about his house there. It's a multi generational three story house. It's been in his family for over 100 years. George's parents lived on the first floor, and George and his wife lived on the second floor. And his adult daughter and her small family lived on the third and final floor. When George's parents passed, as generations did before them, everyone moved before him. This was a great way to live for them because the older generation could age in place with family members nearby to take care of them. The younger generation, benefited from the wisdom and the experience of their older family members. It's better for the environment and leaves a much smaller footprint than a single family home. And it helps to create generational wealth. We need to start building affordable and sustainable housing long line and some of it needs to be multi-generational. Multi-generational. All of it needs to be walkable and bicycle friendly with greater public transportation options. Thank you. Thanks, Audrey. Paul Apperson. I'm Paul Apperson. I believe that we need to build more housing in Longmont. In order to achieve this, zoning laws should be liberalized to allow for uh, more construction of apartment buildings, multiplexes, and townhouses in the city. Minimum parking requirements should also be reduced or eliminated entirely. The population of Colorado grew by almost 15% over the last census period. Every city in the state has an obligation to grow their housing stock to accommodate our new neighbors. If we fail to do this, Colorado will look more and more like California, where homeownership is completely out of reach for vast swaths of the population, and low-income people are displaced from their homes and even their state by the thousands. If we act decisively, however, we can ensure that Longmont remains a stable and welcoming community for people of all income levels. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Taylor Richland, who had to leave, but he gave his state. To Santa Cruz, Hey, now I'm Tanner Wigan. Hey, Tanner, go. Let's go for a short place. I came here to encourage zoning reform by encouraging mixed use in all existing neighborhoods. This can help increase density, be a benefit to the city finances, and increase social cohesion by providing a third place within every neighborhood. Density mixed use style neighborhoods increases walkability, reduces traffic congestion, and ultimately decreases our impact on the environment. Reducing emissions and preserving open space. Let us realize a city that is an organic living organism, and contrary to the envision one of stating places of stability, every neighborhood observes the ability, deserves the ability to have space of necessity within walking distance. Whether our home becomes a doctor's office, small grocery, cafe, farm, studio gathering space, etc. Give the neighborhood green, it, let the neighborhood green what they can to enhance. Our living and our liability. Uh, reform zoning setbacks, lot conversion sizes, encourage park maximums, allow lot conversion to densify, to densify existing neighborhoods while encouraging info development in the same 
So I think all of those comments actually put a final okay on what we've been doing for the past few days because that's exactly what we've been addressing. So we're going to wrap this up. Harold's going to wrap it up for us with what he heard today. Um, and then we'll do a real quick evaluation what worked for folks and what they would change for the next week. So I think it is a good wrap up what we heard. Um, when we started with how do we uh, look at our uh, goals, meaning the house within the staff collectively, and what it looks like. Can't no, I don't know what that is, and I can't get it to stop. Stop. Stop it. <laughs> stop. Is it escape? <gasps> really? Uh, I was just trying to hit full screen. <laughs> so. As we were working through this yesterday, we spent a lot of time talking about um, what we were dealing with internally as staff, and, and we talked about the importance of core services. And then you all, as we started moving through the discussion, said, you know, equity, sustainability, and safety are things that we have to incorporate within the DNA of the organization. And so for me, um, Valerie is putting this together real time as we're going. That's the foundation of the house. And, and your house is always as strong as your foundation. And then you all added the walls of housing for all, early childhood, care and education, and transportation. And then we had steam there that you talked about, which really is that last piece of, of the puzzle, which is the roof. And so, and overriding all of this is how we're working with climate action and what we're doing. So this was our visual representation of what you all talked about. And I wanted to just affirm that what you all would say, is this what you all were, were saying? And I'm not gonna go over the details that you have, we just finished this, but this is the agreement that we're coming to um, as a collective to say, this is what we're gonna work on over the next year. What's gonna make it? I like the visual there. Thank you, good work. It's easy. <laughs> it's great having She's all these folks. You, you see us all chatting and moving. Aww. We're reacting to what you all are, are saying and, and, and building uh, different components. So, real time, as you would say. Real time. I mean, it's real time. So, uh, I just want to say thanks to you, thanks to all the staff that have been here for two days. Uh, I will say, in my 20 plus years of uh, this profession and going through it. This is probably the first time that it really has been for me a goal setting session where it's, it's really the collective working through this. Um, and I want to I want to thank you for your understanding of the core services and, and the challenges that we're facing in today's world as staff and what we're doing. I think we have a really you have <laughs> highlighted our future oh, with cheesy. Oh, with laser <laughs> which, I really like this. Yeah, which for us, what that does is it gives us something manageable that we can wrap our arms around and we can really start driving forward uh, with pace. And uh, I just think as we continue to move forward, as things are coming forward, my commitment is as things come forward from a staff perspective, if it's not in this arena, I will be managing that. As we see things come forward that could distract us from this, I think we have to collectively manage that because we can very quickly spin out and not be able to focus like we need to on this. So if we take that graphic and blow it up and post it in the council chamber, so every time a squirrel comes along or whatever, <laughs> disruptor, we can say, where does, how does it contribute to building out this house or supporting it or, you know, growing uh, our impact on, or reducing our impact on climate change? So I was going to also ask where, where will this PowerPoint and information be? Will it be presented to the general public at some point? That's a great question. So first off, um, Ryken has already changed your vision statements on the city council web page. Oh, wow. So those are already uh, in place right now. Um, I believe the next step is for Harold to bring back a more complete um, goal and, and metric document back out to you all. All of these materials we could certainly post back up. Is that correct, Don? Could we add them to something? Sorry, no. So all these materials could we add them to something? All the they go into the references. They go into the there you go. Right, 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 right. So the giant poster that we'll that we will make sure that we put into the.
So Eric is sending you all my presentation. Just if you're ever asked, you can see sort of how we work through Friday's conversation because I think that's important information for you all. Um, so that if people are asking you to do things, you can always refer to that and say, here's what's going on. And I understand that it's going to go into the, the archives, but I think that for maybe even a couple of weeks, it would be harmful to have on some sort of uh, link in the, there just because then people can access it and you can become a discussion point uh, if they come out and talk to us, counsel on that. The ease of finding it is so invaluable. Certainly one of the things that I think I heard was communication stuff for you all to ask. Now you can either hand out to residents or that you can have in your back pocket that really remind you of, of the data which we'll certainly work on that as well. And, and that's a reformatting with us internally, so I've already talked to you. This is shifting our communication plan mm -hmm. as, we're, as we're looking at this and what you want. So Carol, I'm really good at this, but I want you to continue that when you have to pivot from any of our pillars, or please let us know um, so that we can also tell that to our residents. That, um, Certainly, this is the reporting for these reasons. Yeah. Right. And I think having, you know, we, we call them disruptors. Yeah. I think having a, a conversation on real, you know, again, as disruptors are occurring, we're having that conversation to say, here's this disruptor, here's what it's going to be. I think, you know, certainly what I'm recognizing is that we didn't provide particularly great, you know, hey, here's what's happening in each of these months or quarterly or some sort of reporting so that you can follow along with the better than that. Just going back to the uh, sense here. Eventually. <laughs> Do you take this to Stephanie? She oh. said she wanted a donut. <laughs> oh, I would be happy to take Thank that you. to Stephanie. Yes. Uh, Marcia? Well, this is, this is such a great visual. If STEAM is a kind of a code word at this point, if, if we change that to public amenities or even the third place, um, we should post it all around the city. You know, it's not just inside of the council. We'll kick this to our communications group yeah. so they can work with the graphics. This was, again, Valerie moving fast. I think we did that house. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we do. I hope I someone else does. We're making steam so that it makes sense to us. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so retreat evaluation. So you're at the end. What are things that worked well and things that you would like to see different for next? The only thing that I can see is this this room is absolutely great. But in my classroom, I have this little microphone that goes around my uh, neck in a lanyard form, so I don't have to speak up. And it's really, really handy because I just can click it on, click it off, and that sort of thing. And so now I don't have a teacher voice anymore, uh, like some may have, because of the fact that I don't have to have that. And this is this that would be so useful for this room in the first place. And, uh, and everything, and then they have a microphone, and it's a, it's a outfit that does this. I can see you when I get back to my classroom, if I, if I can sit in the night, because That'd be great. it's really slick. Yeah, thank you. Great. It, it, it was very cool to buy a new room. I'd say you were, you were well prepared. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you did a nice job of getting ready. Uh, say that, I don't know if ever, I've said this publicly before, I don't know if I've ever been in sessions like this that are even better facilitated than what you do. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate the fact that how you two teamed up to adjust and adapt in real time as the conversation unfolded. And then all the presentations from the staff. But there was a lot of activity. Choice of food was great. Yeah. Yeah. Food was great. Yeah. Food was great. I would like to stop and give a round of applause for our yeah. First retreat, and I think she nailed it. <laughs> yeah. And she was managing me in the process. Oh, that's yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. What else? Anything else? Anything else? Either side. I thought that we, as a council, interacted with staff very well with each other, and I think this was 
for all of your pre tech on to the best. Yeah. Kudos to staff, yes, yeah. great. And to you. Yeah. 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 Well, the work you did this out is not easy work. I don't know about anyone else, but I, I did like the two days. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. I'll just find this. This this was a, this was a really good pace, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I didn't I, go. Home, I'm not going to go home today thinking, oh, I wish I would have said that, or oh, you know, we didn't address this issue. Any other feedback? Yeah. Thank you. Everybody around the table, I wish we could have a bigger table <coughs> because, mm -hmm. because we have a lot of people in the back that. You know, we're really contributing every to every break. I was always stopping by and, mm -hmm. to see someone. So, if there's some way to, to do more of that in the future, a bigger rounder table, because but having you guys across facing us was great. I do agree with the microphones. Yeah, I have hearing mm -hmm. issues. Yeah, me too. And if you're working on it, it's hard for me. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, the mayor, I think you're ready to adjourn. I don't even think you have to vote. No, we <laughs> 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 <laughs>